Hello. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the day six and the final day. And today is the uh, uh, refractive and cataract day. Okay. So I, I, many of you, I, I bet, are really interested in the sessions today because several of the stalwarts are here all the way from their cities to help you out in understanding the subject better. Right. So let's start with our first session. That would be the cataract surgery basics. And our chairs for the date uh, for this session are our own golden apple, Dr. Jeevan Dityar, sir, and uh, Dr. Anaga Hirur. She is the uh, she is one of the brightest talent that we have in ophthalmology. And as you have all seen yesterday, that she can do multiple things uh, at the same time, <laughs> right? So uh, she is a medical director at Anilai Hospital, and she's also the secretary MOS and Bob, right? So uh, over to the first talk of the day, and we have with us Dr. Kiran Kirtni, ma'am, who has been absolutely on time for all of you, and uh, she's consultant cornea refractive and cataract services at CFS Delhi, and she'll be talking on preoperative workup in a patient for cataract surgery and biometry. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you so much, Ralika. First. Uh, the first and foremost, good morning to our respected teacher, Tithyal, sir, and uh, Anaga, ma'am. And welcome all of you to the cataract and refractive session. It's going to be your bread and butter for the rest of your life. So very, very important that we are able to do a proper preoperative assessment of a cataract patient. We may have to run through the PPT, but do not worry, because this will be given as a handout to you. And the most of the theoretical aspects will be there with you for a ready retina. So a preoperative assessment, coming to the first part, that is a preoperative assessment, would include taking the ocular history of the patient, the systemic history of the patient, the ocular examination, the relevant ocular investigations, and if pertinent, lab investigations. The ocular history of the patient can again be divided into two heads, wherein first we understand what is the history of the present illness, and then we understand the any pre-existent or associated conditions of the patient's eye. I want you to keep your eyes and ears open and please keep your eyes mostly on the pictures because that will help you get the photographic memory of whatever the patient's symptoms can be. So a point source of light because of the forward and the back scatter can turn into a glare, a halo or a starburst for the patient and can also lead to a monoocular polyopia or diplopia which can be debilitating to the patient. These are the visual simulation as to how a patient of cataract will actually be seen. And mind you, in your actual practice, you may have to remind the patient at multiple junctures that these are the difficulties that the patient is having in his or her daily life and which can impact his daily life by causing possibility of more falls and fractures and even affecting his activities of daily living. The pre-existent conditions like amblyopia, EBMD, keratoconus, macular degeneration should always be kept in mind when you're evaluating such a patient. Medical history, important part is whether the patient has any pre-existent condition which is going to make it difficult for the patient to lie down during the surgery, any history of recent cardiac or you know, cerebrovascular events, any history of asthma. And in the drugs, there are medications which are known to cause cataracts. There are medications that tend to compromise the cataract surgery itself. There are history of anticoagulants, allergies, and is there any history of patient being on long-term steroid? So in this session, we have a few chocolates to give away when you answer the question correctly. So my first question will be, do you know what is Tamsulosin HCL? What is this drug used for? And what is the particular syndrome that it tends to cause? One, one, one person, please. So yes, the, please. Is it used in females? Sorry? BPH is males. They don't have, females don't have a prostate. But yes, in urinary incontinence in females, we can give away the chocolate, Rolika. Thank you so much. 
So the examination would include a visual acuity, glare and contrast sensitivity, intraocular pressure, pupillary reaction testing. Remember, vision is not the only aspect. There is more to vision than black and white. The patient can have poor quality of vision despite being checked on the standard visual charts. So you can definitely incorporate at least a contrast sensitivity uh, testing in your daily life because the gradual progressive decrease in contrast is also one of the symptoms of cataract. Slit lamp, well done, is half the battle won. You all know about the LOCS3 classification, but you also have to keep in mind condi conditions that can be having implications for the cataract surgery, like glaucoma, uveitis, pseudo exfoliation, a lens subluxation. And coming to the ocular investigations, these are the different heads which you need to understand, specular, biometry, topography, OCT, and if required, an ASOC and a UBM. We'll be reading about the biometry in subsequent time, but uh, the rest of the topics will be, have already been covered or will be covered in the hands-on session. Coming to the next slides, mind you again, this is a wake-up session, so I want you all to be attentive, and this is a giveaway chocolate session also. So if you're able to identify the ocular condition correctly, these are all the conditions which will be important for you to identify when you're examining the patient, and these are the conditions which will you know, affect your outcome during the surgery by you know, either affecting the IL power calculations which you are doing, or even you know, post-operatively the recovery and all of the patient. Remember this table. This is a table of why not 2020. My favorite professor used to tell us, any patient who walks into your OPD, if you do not have the answer of why the patient is not 6'6", you have not solved the mystery. So remember this table of pre-existent retinal and non-retinal causes, post-operative retinal and non-retinal causes of why your patient who has been done so beautifully is not 6'6 post-op. So coming to the conditions, guys, be ready. You have to identify these conditions quick, all the pictures, and take away the chocolate. So, yes, the la, yeah, the one who's raised the hand, yeah. Blephritis. Name the blephritis, which type of blephritis? Okay, go ahead, next. Yes, next. Quick, 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 don't we have time? Yeah, next. And it's ectopian also, next. Huh? There's a lot of frothing that you see. Mibomian gland dysfunction, mibomitis, next. Go ahead, come on. Anybody? Yeah, it's a pyogenic granuloma. So you can give away the chocolate rolica though. <laughs> Uh, next condition, anyone, please, quick. Mm, anyone, what will we call the central image? Nobody. Why am I showing this picture? See, if your cornea is like this when you're staining, you cannot proceed for a cataract surgery. You have to first optimize the ocular surface. Yeah? Dry eye, yes, it's, yeah, please, somebody was telling. Yes, so it is punctate epithelial erosions, which can lead to irregular myers, as you can see. And these are the mebomian gland dysfunction areas with dropouts, okay? If this question is answered correctly, I'll give away two chocolates. Quick. These are lumps and bumps. This is a particular disease, which you will see in your practice. It's important to identify. It will influence your surgical outcome by both, you know, wrong measurements during the ocular uh, biometry. Anybody? No? Anybody? No? Two chocolates ka chance, Rolika, they are not taking. What do I do? <laughs> you take. This is EBMD, epithelial basement membrane dystrophy. Okay? Anybody? No, this is not keratoconus. Have a look at the cornea. Have a look at the cornea. Here, what are these? What are these nodules? I've given the hint. Yeah, somebody's saying, stand up and take the chocolate. Who's it? Yeah, please. Yeah, it's Salzman nodular degeneration. So it is causing scarring and irregular astigmatism on the cornea. All these topics will be covered in the later day as how to calculate the patients with high astigmatism and all. This is simple pterygium. Just identify this condition and tell me what investigation you will do for this condition. This is a very important condition, okay? You have to keep in mind that you... 
Tell me, tell me. Yeah, stand up. There is no bully here. Yes, somebody said specular. Who said specular? Yeah. Why would you do a specular here? What is this condition? Yes. And this is? Fuchs endothelial dystrophy, the one in green, Rolika. She will get the chalky. So you need, need to do a specular microscopy, definitely in such cases, and explain to these patients that the visual prognosis at any stage of life can go bad because the patient can have that much fallen D endothelium that the cornea decompensates. Then this is a case of keratoconus, and the lower condition, I'm sure you will not be able to identify, but if anybody is able to? Very good. Very nice. You all know. Very nice. Anybody? The central picture. You have all done this through the week, so you know. Krukenberg spindle. And the condition? Pigment dispersion syndrome. Very nice. This one? And why do you need to know? No, I can't see any PXF. This, is, this last picture has a PXF. I marked the narrow. Yes. Who said that? Yeah, please. Thank you. And what about this one? Can you please tell me why uh, there is so much of shallowing? Can you just think and why, what, what is the particular instrument we need to have in the OT when we are thinking of such a case? And what are the preparation? Sorry? No, no. In the OR. What do we need to have in the OR? Okay, so if there is severe zonulopathy, the whole lens system will shift forward. And you need to have a capsular tension ring or a shiony ring when you're having such a case. And a retina backup, definitely, where you may need an SFIOL. Anybody? Last condition, this is okay. So your last chance. This is very easy. The first one. Who said macular hole? Chocolate to lelo, yaar. Second one is macular hole. First one is... <laughs> It's an ERM, simple, but you have to keep in mind. So OCT becomes an important investigation in our pre-op workups because there are up to 10 to 17 percent of the patients who will have an ERM and we will not be able to identify it or label it for the patient or explain as a prognosis to the patient. It is very important in daily practice to explain to the patient what can be their visual potential or what all can worsen the visual potential of the patient. Coming to the next topic, which is biometry, we'll be covering this in short because we have very less time. See, in the cataract surgery, the natural lens is just being replaced by an artificial eye well. But remember, cornea is responsible for two-thirds of the focusing power, and lens is responsible for, less, for approximately one-third of the remaining power. That is approximately 20 diopters. The replaced lens has to be considered, you know, uh, according to certain measurements which important ones being axial length, the keratometry, which is the study of the interior curvature of the corneal surface, and finally a biometry, which is analysis of the biological data using mathematical and statistical tools. So axial length, very important to remember, a one mm error in the axial length will give rise to 2.5 diopter error in the calculation. This is an important thing for you to remember. The important methods of measurement are ultrasound, which can be either contact or immersion, and through light, which is through interferometry, as in the optical biometers. Okay? So remember that in an ultrasound A scan, the axial measurement is being done from the anterior surface of the cornea to the internal limiting membrane, whereas in the optical biometry, the same is being done from tearful to the retinal pigment epithelium. While the ultrasound scan is using a broadband, uh, broadband USC, the optical biometer is just using a narrow beam of light. So keratometry is basically measuring the central 3 to 3.2 millimeter zone, and an error of one diopter is going to approximately cause one diopter error, or a 0.9 diopter error in the IOL power. The average readings being 43 to 44. You need to remember what is a gull strand ratio. That is the ratio between the anterior and the posterior corneal radius, and it's approximately 1.13. It will be affected in a condition wherein if we are changing the curvatures, that is in LASIK, the gull strand ratio changes, and hence the IOL power measurement also. Important perimeters are ELP, ACD, but you remember that the effective lens position that the lens will eventually take is only predictable. It's not exactly calculable. Various lens constants which are given by the company for their lenses. Uh, can you identify all the instruments? Anyone? Any one person? All of them? Yeah. Bulu, bulu. 
या हु सेइंग एक बंदा खड़ो के बोलो बताओ बताओ कम ऑन फास्ट नो इट्स नॉट एज स्पेक्युलर इट्स एन ऑटोमेटेड केयर एक्टिविटी एनीवेज नेक्स्ट यस ऑफ स्कैन नो व्हाट इज द लास्ट वन दिस इज नॉट ऑफ स्कैन no this one which i'm saying this is a pentacam okay this very good contact is scan this is immersion is scan very good so the newer instrument the latest instrument that is almaster 700 it's a novel non invasive optical biometer with a wavelength of 1050 nanometer and it can take information of corneal anterior posterior surface lens anterior posterior surface macular neuroepithelium and even the pigment epithelium interface calculation formula you will be reading there are multiple formulas and they have been divided into many things the only thing i want you to remember right now is the preferred formula when the axial length is less than 22 a preferred formula will be in hofo q more than 22 most commonly the uh, preferred formula is srkt in a myopic lasik patient a hage cell is the most preferred formula and when you are doing a piggy back it's holiday's refractive formula so my time is about to be over this will be given to you so don't worry special situations like if akki keratoconus post via surgery where there is a silicon oil which is affecting the sound of uh, velocity of ultrasound all of these things will change the ial power so an optical biometer gives you a better uh, answer to these questions instead of a wrong estimation of ial otherwise if you're doing on a normal a scan you need to do a 2 to 3 over adapter over correction post rk also if the zone is clear do a standard biometry if it's not clear use true k post lasik and all you the girl strand ratio is change so newer devices and newer formula like hage cell and barrett 2k work better there are online calculators which can you can which you can use later in your life like ascaris or the hill rbf formula so this is all from my side you have to repeat measurements if the measurements are outside range and this is this all you'll get so this is more theoretical an aspect thank you and all the best to all of you thank you uh, dr kiran uh, uh, doing a, such a nice work i think she did cover the all the basic aspects of uh, examination diagnosing then uh, planning your you know biometry ial power calculation very nicely done one thing i like to stress uh, for younger people is you, sh you should examine your patient before you take up for surgery yourself that is very important and put in your mind what you know difficulty you might face during the surgery and what precaution you have to take second important thing is that most of the time biometries are done by you know technicians very rarely by you know ophthalmologists but in your phase you will be doing yourself so one thing is important you should make sure the patient is comfortable understands the examination proper counseling has to be done and other important part is any instrumentation which is being used should be calibrated because that is very very important calibration of instrumentation very uh, important it may be done weekly monthly but it has to be done and as she rightly said we have various formulas nowadays the new generation formula will be better and most devices do have that if you don't have that you have a online calculators which uh, she nicely pointed out for a normal cases as well as for difficult cases also like post refractive <coughs> surgeries post vr surgeries silicon filled eyes or even those cases where you have a error in your uh, calculations and you have a patient who had a different eye will inside the eye then you have to redo it those formulas also ha can be calculated in terms of keratometry i think we'll cover subsequently during toric implantation also it's not only the anterior curvature which is important you are looking for a posterior corneal curvature also especially for a toric and multifocal or trifocal iis that means you have to look for a tk rather than only looking for anterior keratometry so that is a few important tips you should look into thank you uh, kiran for yeah. doing a nice job Next. yeah thank you dr kiran one just one more point you should always check both eyes even if the patient if you are planning right eye cataract surgery look at the other eye because there could be changes they, you should see whether both the eyes correlate if one eye is amblyopic all these things also are important and if there is a difference in keratometry between the two eyes axial length all this becomes very very important i uh, would like to now invite the next speaker dr geetansha sachde she is the consultant cataract and refractive services the i foundation with extensive research on fake kiol smile c3r icr segments and femtolaser cataract surgery yeah.
She would be speaking to us on understanding phacodynamics and fluidics. Just a request, the speakers should take around 10 to 11 minutes so that we have two, three minutes for discussion. So very good morning to all of you. Uh, my talk today is on phacodynamics and fluidics. So now when one is doing a phaco, there are three important things that come into play. The first is you use the ultrasound energy to break down the nucleus. But when you're doing that, you're producing heat. So this is where the irrigation fluidics will help you to counteract this buildup. And obviously you have the aspiration will, will, which will help you to remove the emulsate. So we'll discuss it under fluidics and ultrasound. So first things first, you need to know your machine. You have a console here which shows you all the settings of the various uh, steps. The handpiece is what is connected to the FACO tip which allows the ultrasound. And the foot pedal here will allow you to control the different steps during your surgery. So we'll start with the foot pedal. We all know that the foot position of zero is the resting phase. And then subsequently we have irrigation along with aspiration and finally the FACO power. So let's discuss these one by one. So what we have essentially is an irrigation bottle, which is what is going to give you the infusion into the anterior chamber. In foot position zero, which is the resting space, there is a pinch well which will close this irrigation so nothing is entering the eye. So as of now, you have no inflow and no outflow. When you go to foot position one, this pinch well will release and the fluid will enter the AC. So you will have an inflow but you have no active outflow. You'll still have outflow through your leaky incisions, but there is no active outflow. When you go on to foot position two, the pump will activate, and now it will begin to aspirate the material out of the anterior chamber, which is inflow plus outflow. Foot position three is when the piezoelectric crystals will start to oscillate, and you will have an additional FACO power. Now, an important thing that a lot of the people don't look into is the range span, wherein you can change the ranges for which these positions will vary. So for the beginners, it is better to have a higher range in foot position two, which is I and A. How that helps is that you don't inadvertently go to foot position three and use more power than is required. Also, once you have a hold, you will not go into foot position one by mistake and lose that hold. Okay, so we've already discussed foot position one, wherein you've released the pinch valve, and now you have an infusion into the eye. The important thing to remember here is there is no linear control here, which means once you go into position one, you have the irrigation. It's not that it will continue to keep increasing as you keep going down the foot position one. Now the irrigation fluidics have evolved. Gravity fluidics is what we see more often where you see this bottle which is hanging from a height, and this gives you the infusion pressure. So for every 15 centimeters above the patient's eye, it will give you about 10 to 11 millimeters of mercury inside. Hyperpressured fluidics will use air pumps in order to achieve this pressure in the bottle. And the latest is the active fluidics technology, which is available with the Centurion, wherein you will have sensors within the irrigation, the aspiration line, which will sense the IOP fluctuations and accordingly get it back to the target IOP. So just to explain to you, in gravity-fed fluidics, there is a high variation in IOP. Now, when you have irrigation, all the fluid is entering the eye, nothing is leaving, so your IOP will be at the highest. Once the aspiration begins, because you're aspirating some of the fluid, this IOP will begin to fall. Then you'll have occlusion. So when occlusion is happening, again, you're having irrigation, but there's nothing which is going into the FACO probe. So again, the IOP will begin to rise. And once this occlusion breaks, because there's a sudden inflow of fluid into the FACO probe again, the IOP will again fall. So it's highly fluctuating, whereas in the active fluidics, it's somewhat stable. So this just explains that when you're aiming for something around 55, your play will be anywhere between 30 to 80 in a gravity. But when you have active fluidics, it is only a variation of around 2.6 millimeters. So this is essentially through sensors in the irrigation and the aspiration line, which pick up the IOP and send this sensation back to the cassette. There's also an active sentry, which is the latest, where you additionally have a sensor in the handpiece, which picks up these fluctuations. Now we'll go on to the foot position two, wherein we've now activated the pump. So we also have an active outflow. It's always important to remember that your inflow should be at least equal to or preferably more than your outflow. 
Now the two major components of your outflow will be your AFR and your vacuum. Now what is flow rate? It's the quantity of the fluid that is pulled into the FACO probe per minute through the aspiration tip. Now why this is important is if you have a lower flow, the pieces will come slowly towards the FACO tip or your followability will be lower. If you have a higher flow rate, the pieces will go much faster. So this gives you a faster FACO with a higher followability. Another couple of things you need to realize for your followability, which are in your hands, literally, is that one is your FACO tip should be in the middle of the sleeve. You shouldn't be pushing it to one side. The second is that the holes of the sleeve should be side to side and not up and down. So how this works is that you have a positive infusion pressure which goes like this, and you have a negative aspiration pressure which goes like this, which sets this triangle of tranquility. And these eddy currents will give you the perfect followability. On the other hand, if you're pushing it to one side, you'll notice that the irrigation from here is suboptimal, and obviously your followability will become lower. The second important thing that we were discussing is the vacuum. So what the vacuum is, is once the occlusion is maintained for the peristaltic, no more fluid is entering, because you've essentially blocked the FACO probe. But since the rollers are still moving, a negative pressure will start to build in the FACO probe, which is what gives you the vacuum or the hold. So the AFR will give you the followability where it's unoccluded and the pieces are going towards the probe. But once the piece has occluded it, the vacuum will give you the subsequent purchase over the nucleus. Now the time that it takes from, for the maximum preset vacuum to set after the occlusion is something that is known as rise time. This is for a peristaltic machine. So again, AFR will give you the followability, which will help to bring the pieces, occlude the tip, which will then give you a vacuum. The time that will take for the maximum vacuum post-occlusion is your rise time. Another important thing that you need to remember while looking at the outflow parameters is the tubing compliance. Now, like I was telling you guys earlier, that once the vacuum is built, there'll be a negative pressure which starts to build into this. So the amount of the deformation of this outflow tube, once the vacuum is giving a negative pressure, is the amount of compliance. So if the tube has a higher compliance, it will deform more. Now, you shouldn't have a very high compliance because what you can have after that is a post-occlusion surge. So right now, we have occlusion here. We have a negative vacuum which is built. Suddenly, when the piece has entered the FACO, this negative pressure here, and there'll be a high positive pressure in the anterior chamber. So because of this large difference, there'll be a sudden inflow of the fluid from the anterior chamber into the aspiration tubing, which will cause an AC collapse. Now you can prevent surge by obviously increasing the inflow or reducing the outflow. The other thing that we've discussed is the compliance. You should have a lower compliance. Venting in ABS, I'll just discuss. So venting is nothing but a small bolus of air or fluid which is given into the aspiration line once the maximum vacuum or the negative pressure has been achieved. So this will keep reducing the negative pressure and will reduce the occlusion surge. This can either be a fluid or an air vent, but a fluid is preferable. ABS is nothing but this hole, so it's a bypass. So you're bypassing going into the anterior chamber and coming all the way back. You're essentially going from the irrigation into the aspiration line, into the probe, okay? So same thing, if a negative vacuum is there, once the preset vacuum has achieved, a little bit of fluid will go from the sleeve into the FACO probe and reduce this negative pressure. So when we discuss the pumps, the two ones that I'll be discussing right now are the peristaltic and the venturi systems. How the peristaltic works is that you'll have these knobs which will rotate and they'll give this pincer-like mechanism and it will pinch the tube, which will create a negative pressure and will draw the fluid from the anterior chamber. <coughs> so when it is open and there's no occlusion, you'll have fluid which will keep going out. This will give you the AFR. Okay, the AFR is determined by the speed at which this is moving. So obviously if it's rolling faster, the negative pressure is faster and the fluid goes out earlier or gives you the AFR. Once the occlusion is there, you have no more fluid going out. So your AFR is now reduced, but this will continue to keep rolling and it will give you a negative pressure here, which is now what is giving you your vacuum. And it will continue to roll till you reach the maximum preset vacuum. So we'll just go through this again. You'll have no vacuum in the beginning till your occlusion. Once the occlusion is achieved, it will continue to rise till it reaches the maximum preset. 
the vacuum will continue till the occlusion stays, and once the occlusion breaks, there'll be a sudden fall of vacuum again. AFR on the other high will be more in the beginning till the occlusion is reached. After the occlusion, no more fluid is entering, so obviously the AFR starts to go down till the maximum vacuum is achieved. Again, it will come back up once the occlusion is broken. This will give you a surge because along with the AFR, you also will have more fluid entering because the compliance of the tube will also give way. So here is when the maximum inflow will happen. Venturi is different. This basically works on a compressed gas. So that will pass and create a negative pressure or a vacuum here, and that will essentially draw the fluid into this tank. So the Venturi system, you don't need a occlusion to build your vacuum. Your vacuum will come as soon as you go into your foot position too because the gas is released. So here again, like we said, the vacuum will continue to rise till it reaches the preset maximum. It is not occlusion dependent and then it continues to be stable. AFR and vacuum are related here. The AFR will also rise, but however, once you have your occlusion, no more fluid will enter the eye and it will reduce. So the major difference between peristaltic and venturi is that in the peristaltic, the vacuum will build after occlusion and will reduce after occlusion. However, in the venturi, the vacuum is independent of the occlusion and it is dependent on how much you're pressing your Keiko uh, foot pedal. So flow rate and vacuum are independent in peristaltic, but in venturi, they go hand in hand. The next is the handpiece. So this essentially is a piezoelectric crystal. The electric energy via the handpiece will get transmitted to the FACO tip, which will then oscillate. So how does it work? Uh, this is fairly theoretical, so I'll skip this. Essentially, the main ones are the jackhammer effect and the microcavitation theory. Now, important thing about the FACO tips is that you have different types of bevels. So a very high bevel will give you a better cutting power, but a very low bevel will give you a better hold. So to kind of get the best of both, both worlds, we use the center, which is around a 30 degree bevel. You can have a straight tip, you can have a bent tip. The gauges will also vary. Uh, okay, I'll just move on to the third part. I think this is Vaco one. So position three is the ultrasound energy. Now the two things which determine the ultrasound, the first is the frequency and the second is the stroke. Stroke is how far the Vaco tip will move back and forth. And this is dependent on how much you're pressing the foot pedal. So in order to increase the power, you have to increase the stroke length. Frequency, on the other hand, is how fast the FACO tip will move. And this is dependent on the machine, and you cannot change it. So we'll just discuss the modes of power quickly. You have continuous, pulse, and burst. Continuous means that as soon as you enter into foot position three, you will have a continuous power. It doesn't come on and off. Panel mode will give you the preset maximum at the very beginning and it continues to remain the same. In linear, it starts to rise and continues to go till the maximum once you've reached the end of foot pedal three. Pulse mode has both an on and an off time. The reason for this is that it helps to prevent the repulsion by the longitudinal tip and also gives you some time for the FACO tip to cool. So the time that it's working is the on time. The time that it's off is the interval is the off time. The cycle time will be on plus off, and the duty cycle is the percentage for what it is on. <coughs> so when you have a pulse mode in linear, essentially what will happen is your duty cycle will not change. All that will change is the amount of power per pulse. So as you keep going higher, you'll see that the power per pulse is increasing, but the on off time remains the same. On the other hand, if you go into burst mode, the power remains the same, but as you keep going into the foot position three, you'll realize that the duty cycle is increasing, which is how you will have more power. So this is just the last slide, wherein in a normal continuous linear mode, you start from the minimum and go on to the preset maximum as you keep pressing the foot pedal three. In pulse, the power will keep increasing, but the duty time will not change. In burst, the power will remain the same per pulse, but the duty time will continue to increase. So just to conclude, you need to understand your machine and optimize your settings and your fluid, fluidics to get your ideal FICO case done. Thank you. Thank you, Gitan uh, doing a, such a uh, nice you know, uh, job. I know that uh, uh, the FICO dynamics is a one hour session to cover everything in a very, very nice manner, but she did a wonderful job to 
make it look so simple and easy, it's very difficult to understand sometimes, especially people who are, are beginners, because to understand your machine is one of the most important part of uh, you know, getting expertization in the surgery as such. Thank you, Gitansha, for covering all the points. And in between you have queries, we can take those questions also. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Anaga Harur. Uh, you all uh, heard her, uh, uh, I think, qualities yesterday. I think she Poetry. Yeah, po poetry, yeah. And uh, she is the West Zone member for ARC. And uh, she is the secretary of Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society, one of the most wonderful person I have uh, met in the last few years. And uh, wonderful teacher and wonderful orator, Dr. Anaga, please. And she's going to cover the basic parts of initiating the surgery. As she written there, half, uh, well beginning is a half done, it's not that. Well beginning is a beginning for entire surgery. So she's going to cover incision, cath lot, me, and other basic aspects. Dr. Anaga. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Very good morning to all of you. So I hope everybody is awake. And now we'll be starting with uh, the talk. So we'll be covering the initial first few steps of the cataract surgery. So when you look at incision, you have the main port and you have the paracentesis or the side ports. Now whether you have one or two side ports depends on the surgeon's preference and what instruments he's using. And usually they are two to three clock hours away from the main port. So you need to look at this funnel. So this is an imaginary funnel. So there are these two imaginary lines where there are three millimeters at the limbus and there are two diverging lines. What is important to note is all incisions in this funnel are usually astigmatically neutral. The more close you are to the limbus, it's going to induce more astigmatism. The more posterior you are, it will induce less astigmatism. So we'll be covering different parts of the incision construction. Now, there are different kinds of incision depending on where you take the first cut, okay? It could be just limbal, when you're doing it at the limbus, it could be corneoscleral or it could be pure corneal. Now, what is the advantage, of, say for example, when you're taking a scleral incision? You know it's a vascular structure. Because the tissue bed is vascular, the healing is faster. But, and it could be more astigmatically neutral because it's away from the cornea. But disadvantage is, yes, you'll have to open up the conjunctiva. There will be a little bleeding. You will need to use cautery. And the more cautery you use excessively, it can cause scarring at the edges. And that itself also can induce astigmatism. So you need to be careful. Now, when you're looking at clear corneal incisions, because nowadays we are using topical anesthesia, that is why it is easier and is better to do corneal uh, incisions. It gives a better cosmesis. There's no conjunctival trauma, no bleeding, no need of cautery. But if you have a slightly larger clear corneal incision, then it could become more, it can induce more astigmatism, more chances of infection, and it could be probably less stable. So it becomes a little risky. So you have to be very sure that your incisions are sealed well. Now, when you look at the incision archi architecture, what is the main aim of the incision? Because this is from where you're going to put in your FACO probe. This is going to be Till the end of the surgery, you're going to make all the manipulations through this incision. So it has to be at the end of the surgery, self-sealing, because you're not going to take sutures here. So what are the prerequisites is you need to create a corneal valve, and the more square it is, it's better, or it should be rectangular. It should not be very short. So you have three ways. You can have either a straight uniplanar, or a two-step, or a three-step. Now, if you look at the triplanar, Okay, now it's very under, you know, we can make out from the name uniplanar, biplanar, and triplanar. Now, what is the advantage of a triplanar is you have an initial groove, then you have a beveled incision, and then you dimple down and then enter the anterior chamber parallel to the iris. So, because it's a multiplanar, now tell me one thing which is better, uniplanar or multiplanar? Yeah. So, what is uh, the most stable is a two to three millimeter square shaped incision, multiplanar, with a smooth uniform internal incision. You can do it manual and today you have access to femtosecond laser also. Now to answer your question of whether a uniplanar or multiplanar and to remember this, this was an experiment done by Louis Pasteur in 1862. He actually demonstrated that there were two bottles that he sterilized. And he showed that the bottle with the curved opening remained sterile for a longer time. So obviously, that logic, when you apply it to the incisions, definitely with multiplanar, there's less risk 
of the external fluid, especially if there is hypotony, to enter inside, so less re uh, risk of infection. Again, depending on the material of the blade that you are using, we all know that it should be very sharp. That is why we, even when we are using reusable blades, you should not reuse multiple times. You should use only one blade per patient. So the diamond uh, blade is usually the sharpest, but for beginners, sometimes it can cause an advert advertent uh, premature entry, or suddenly if you enter, then it can cause damage to the capsule or the iris. And if you use a metal blade, it depends on the quality and the consistency of the blade or the material. So here you are having now two side ports that you are making paracentesis, putting in viscoelastic, and now you see you are stabilizing the globe, making the initial groove, which is around 250 microns, with the 2.8, this is a 2.8 millimeter incision, going straight, then dipping down at around 2 to 2.5 millimeters, and then entering parallel to the iris. If you see, it is a smooth in, smooth out. There is no wriggling movement. Many times, if the blade becomes a little blunt, what you tend to do is move it side to side. So it becomes an oblique entry, and it can cause more damage and a poor incision. Now, some practical tips for a good phaco incision. Now, you can see, farther you go from the center of the cornea, peripherally, it's better. So you should have just barely nicking the limbal vessels. Even if it bleeds a little bit, it's good. It should not be totally clear corneal. Secondly, uh, because this is uh, going to induce least astigmatism when you are pe most peripheral. Now, the second thing is look at the symmetry of the incision. Now, I want you to look very carefully at the top and the bottom. Now, if you look at the left side, you see you there's a square appearance, which is the what is supposed to be the best. And the lower part, you can see it's a triangle, okay? That's called as a chevron appearance. Now, why do you get the chevron appearance is many times you go very, uh, where you make the first groove, you're going, entering into the cornea, and then suddenly you change the angle and dip directly. So when there's a sudden change, that causes the chevron appearance. Now, what is the difference in the symmetry? Ideally, the roof and the floor should be equal. Now, if you look at the uh, first part on the above, you can see it's an equal thickness of the roof and floor. But below, if you see with the chevron incision, the floor is very thick and the roof is very shallow. So it should not be like that because that doesn't seal so well. So here we are showing you, this is a overlay, digital overlay, where we are doing planning a toric IOL. So you have do, done the paracentesis, and now the incision site is at zero, as you can see here. So again, you're stabilizing the globe, making the initial groove. <coughs> as you're going into the corneal stroma, and now you're dipping it. See, you can see the dimple that is occurring. This will cause the chevron incision. Now, when you're coming out, you see how you have the tip triangle there. So this is what you need to avoid. Another thing is, do not overfill the anterior chamber too much with OVD. If it's too tight, then it probably increases the chance that you have a very short entry and a uniplanar incision. <coughs> Another thing is, the entry should be radial, not oblique. So straight in, straight out. Not too short, because that can cause, especially in IFIS, it can cause more chances of iris prolapse. Not too long, because that can cause a restriction of the movement of the instruments. So it should be an ideally square or a rectangle with a two millimeters, maximum 2.5 millimeters into the cornea. If you look at the site, so for beginner, superior, you may find it better, but if it's a deep set eye, definitely, it may not be very convenient. The temporal one usually induces least astigmatism. It's more away from the visual axis. And if you have a patient who is already glaucoma and uh, long standing, who may need glaucoma surgeries, you should keep the superior part sight free for glaucoma surgeries. Or you can do a on axis, on the steep axis, a clear corneal incision. Size depends on what size of the phaco probe you use. Today we use the 2.2 millimeter. And then the astigmatism that is usually induced is what is the centroid, that is a 0 0.1 millimeter, a 0 0.1. Now, the side ports, remember, see, you may have one or two side ports on each side, around um, two to three clock hours on each side for better manipulation. Again, they are tangential to the iris. External size is around 1.5. Internal is around 1, 1.2. Now, what is important to note is what is the size of the side port? It should not be too large or leaky. Now, suppose, and it should fit the diameter of the instrument. 
what happens if it is too large? The fluid will leak. In fact, the side port leakage is more than in the main incision. So what happens if the chamber shallows? You will have the PC which is coming up. Because of the wound leak, the nuclear fragments will not come towards the phaco tip and there is a greater chance of PCR. Okay? If it is too tight, what can happen? There will be a lot of corneal folds around it, so your visibility will be affected. Now, that is why at the end of the surgery, you have to see that they are tight and when you are doing stromal hydration, be careful. Also, when you are doing stromal hydration, be careful that you don't induce a decimate detachment. Otherwise, DMD is very common when you do a stomal hydration. So do it more posteriorly, not anteriorly. So if they, are keep, if they are leaky at the end of the surgery also, there's greater risk of infection, IOP fluctuation, and the IOL may not remain stable, especially if it's a toric lens or a multifocal lens. Now, if you see the OCT pictures of some incisions, you can see that many times there is no good coaptation of the wound or there could be an endothelial gaping. So at the end of surgery, if you have hypotony, if the eye is very soft, what can happen is the vertical incision can open up, okay? That is why you should have a high IOP at the end of the surgery. What happens with the high IOP is the two lips of the horizontal incision come together, stick together. So you have a watertight incision. Now, so there could be some wound complications. If you are excessively manipulating, then there could be, uh, especially if you're doing a wound-assisted IOL implantation, you can cause wound stretching, wound burns. Various uh, reasons why you can have wound burns is if you have very hard brown cataract, you're using continuous power for a long time, and there is irrigation and aspiration is stopped during a, uh, occlusion, and there's a clogging of a phaco tip, all this can, or if it's a tight and long incision. So how do you manage wound burns? First of all, if you see that you are having a wound burn, change your phaco fluidics settings to minimize the occlusion, reduce your phaco power, cooling with frequent irrigation, and yes, suture the wound if you think it's leaky. So basically, if you have a well-constructed, well-configured incision, it facilitates all the steps of surgery, reduces infection, and risk of infection, and better fluidics. Now, let's go on to the capsular excess. Now, ideal capsular excess is usually around the pupil and uniformly circular. That is why it's called as a continuous curvilinear capsular excess. Size is around 5 to 5.5 and 360 degrees, you should have good overall coverage of the anterior capsule over the lens. Now, first and foremost, you should have a good, well-dilated pupil, good uh, magnification, if it's not well dilated, especially for beginners, you use pupillary expanders. Should have a good glow. So along this good glow, you can see exactly what you are doing. And then you can have a continuous curvilinear capsular axis like this. From the side port, it's better. So if it's an intumescent cataract, it's better to do a two-step axis. So you're doing a very small axis, uh, decompressing the bag, using the micro, uh, micro scissors, making a small nick, and using the micro forceps to extend the incision. Sometimes you can have an incision like this. Uh, when you're trying to do a uh, intumescent cataract, you're trying to do a small one, but you can see how it goes out. So it's basically an Argentinian flag sign. Now, the reason why I wanted to show you this is, see here, actually it was the V that was created. That V caused the sudden uh, tear in the anterior capsule. So you should never have a V. It should always be curvilinear. Now, for want of time, I'll just rush through the slides. So basic physics is shearing versus ripping. So you have this uh, shearing where you're actually going round from point one to point four, where you're, uh, the ripping is where you're using the forceps trying to bring in the surrexes towards the center. So it's a centripetal force, whereas the zonular fibers have a tendency to pull it centrifugal. So you have to see to it that it is along the uh, iris or parallel to the iris. Again, the outside in is better at the end of the completion instead of an inside out, which can again have a V and an extension. Anterior chamber should be maintained, flatten the anterior capsule, and use staining. Either you can use cystitome or a forceps. Now, come just last one or two slides, the hydro procedures. You have the hydro dissection and the hydro delineation. So the hydro dissection is where you're separating the nucleus from the cortex. Hydro delineation is when you are separating the endonucleus from the epinucleus and you have the cortical cleaving hydrodissection. 
so basically you what you do in hydro dissection is just lift the anterior capsule and see the fluid wave passing from one end to the other and then decompress at the center in hydro delineation you are putting it into the substance of the lens so you can see the golden ring like that so uh, what is important is decompress the bag each time do it in small short spurts so that you don't create an excessive pressure so friends well begun is half done so all these initial procedures are extremely important so that you have a good complete uh, surgery and good visual outcome thank you so much thank you dr anaga uh, covering the you know initial part so nicely we can understand uh, seeing and you know uh, watching somebody is uh, easier and uh, doing is difficult so you have to practice all these things make sure you perfect and the rexis she showed was it was better than a femtosecond rexis <laughs> i think there was a lady's hand uh, better than a robotic hand <laughs> thank you uh, anaga for thank doing you. a great great uh, justice i think next i think we're going to shift to a little bit uh, modification of program uh, we have to give a respect to uh, dr harvans lal who has been a pioneer in the field of phacomusification and sics and his books are uh, i think one of the most popular books across the country and we have all learned tricks tricks from uh, his uh, lectures his videos and i have not seen uh, more you know uh, wonderful uh, speaker and teacher than dr harvans lal all yours uh, thank you professor tedial for such a kind words incidentally if you don't have my book and any one of you need you can have a complimentary copy you just uh, send some mr and pick up the book from my uh, clinic free of cost so any one of you if you don't have a book it's available on the net i mean uh, you can read it over there but if you want a hard copy all of you can get complimentary just send any mr send your name we'll send you the book so uh, now i come to the basics of phaco emulsification so when we do phaco emulsification there are uh, certain important uh, aspects of it one is the anatomical facts we got to keep in mind how the eye is how your machine and choppers are and what are the nucleus removal techniques and what are the important terminology you need to understand that so the parameter settings already has been covered but the most important is that the parameter setting will depend upon the clarity of the cornea that means if cornea is not clear probably you need a lower parameter setting same way anterior chamber depth if it is shallow you need a lower setting if it is deep higher settings pupil and iris if the pupil is small you need a lower setting genules if they are weak you need a lower setting and lens and a nucleus if the lens is soft you need a lower setting if the lens is hard you need a higher setting and then it will the settings will also depend the generation of the machine you have depending upon the phaco machine experience you have like many experienced sur surgeons like professor tetial can operate at 600 back home without any problem and the technique you are going to adopt so the nucleus anatomy the most important is that we need to understand that the nucleus is concave backwards so trench has to be deeper at the center so most of the time we make a horizontal trench which is deep at the periphery when you try to crack it central does not give way and particularly it becomes very very important we are operating a hard cataract and then there is another concept what we call as a central safe zone all the phaco emulsification has to be performed in the central zone not into the periphery and because there is a maximum space any fragment anything has to be pulled into the center and then sucked over there not to be sucked into the periphery this is a peripheral unsafe zone if you try to suck the material over there you may catch the iris or you may tear the capsule so be careful that bring all the material whether it's a cortical material ep nucleus nucleus into the central zone and suck it over there don't suck into the periphery vacuum is the how strong you are going to hold the nuclear fragment and flow rate decides how fast the things will happen how quickly you will build up the uh, the vacuum so the when you are holding is a hard cataract you need to hold it very strong to chop it and if you see the area that means if there is a tip size is 0.30 0.45 the hold is nearly two and a half times more so the area into the vacuum will decide how strong you are going to hold so whenever you are going to use operate the hard cataract use the regular tip don't use the micro tip you won't be able to get a very strong hold 
Now, there are many techniques, but primarily we can say that divide and conquer, chopping and stop and chop are the most popular technique. And steps, most of the time needed is the trenching, splitting the nucleus into two, chopping those fragments further into smaller pieces, and then aspirating them, uh, what we call as a FACO aspiration. So irrespective of the technique. When you are doing a trenching, if you use the Kelman tip, it is very good for trenching, may not be so good for chopping, but trenching, particularly if it is hard cataract, deep nucleus, or myopic eyes, the Kelman tips really helps a lot. When you are, how much energy to deliver when you are trenching, there should be no pushing of the nucleus. That means when you are pressing down, your tip should move smoothly without pushing the nucleus. If the nucleus is getting pushed, that means you are not giving adequate energy. And if you are creating an air bubble over there, uh, cavitation bubble over there, that means you are giving too much of energy. You can use the continuous mode or even high pulse mode is okay in this. Depth, as I already talked, when you are trenching, it has to be deep in the center. And width will depend upon the hardness of the nucleus because if you need to go deeper, you need to trench wider at the top so that you can reach into the depth of the nucleus. So this is a divide and conquer. Advantage, it is simple, uh, reproducible. Only thing is that it takes a little more FACO energy, but it's very good for the bigness. There's absolutely nothing wrong in this technique because the time and energy is not important. Because the energy delivered for making trench causes no collateral damage whatsoever irrespective of the time because energy is far away from the cornea and there's enough of cooling period over there. Then came the chopping. The FACO energy is drastically reduced in chopping. Sometimes it is very difficult to chop in a very soft cataract and a very hard cataract. It's very, very difficult to chop and there may be high failure rate. And then came the stop and chop. It derived its name. You start as a divide and conquer. After making one trench, do not make the another trench stop here and go into the chopping mode. That's how it is called, the stop and chop. And this, to my mind, is the best technique for all types of cataract, whether it's very soft or very hard. So this is my preferred technique for all types of cases. So when we talk of uh, the chopping, we need to understand there is a term called vacuum seal. Then there is a chopping, which is central, also called vertical, because you're pushing the tip down, peripheral or horizontal, and modified peripheral chop, or sometimes when you do without making any trench, or minimal trench, it is called direct chop. So there may be some terminology confusing, but the basic is, the remains the same whether you are chopping the nucleus from the periphery or chopping the nucleus from the anterior surface going down. So vacuum seal is the most important step to understand. That is, you go and nudge your tip into the nucleus once you are divided into two, and it should not be superficial. It should be the center of the nucleus. Take dip deeper. Most of the time, people make a mistake trying to hold in this superficially, where the nucleus is soft and the grip is not very strong. So in the center of the nucleus, first nudge your tip, be into vacuum two, setting foot pedal two, and then give a burst of energy and bury the tip approximately a millimeter or so inside. Now raise your foot pedal back to come into the position two. Not, don't remain in the three, otherwise it will keep on widening and you will lose the vacuum seal. When you come into the two, if you come two up, then the, you will lose the holding power. So be in the two and hold it over there. So this is called seal by vacuum so that you can strongly hold the nucleus. So this is what we do. We nudge the nucleus, create a vacuum, and hold it over there before you start chopping. So the peripheral chop was the original chop invented. And in this, what we do is we put the chopper underneath the rexus margin, horizontally lying there. Then we create a vacuum seal and after creating a vacuum seal, we turn the chopper vertical, start pulling towards the tip. Once it comes closer to the tip, then we move it sideways to create a split into the nucleus. This is a peripheral chop. In a central chop or a vertical chop, we create a vacuum seal without going underneath the rexus margin, just bury the tip towards the vitreous cavity, towards the disc down, and once it is buried, move sideways. So the cumbersome step of going underneath the rexus is avoided, but this needs completely sharp chopper 
thinner chopper, that needs a little blunt chopper when you go underneath these excess margins. And what I call as a modified peripheral chop. Peripheral chop is stronger, easier, cuts the nucleus in one go. But uh, modified peripheral chop, instead of now negotiating the chopper underneath the rectus margin, you bring the periphery of the nucleus out of the rectus margin and start chopping. So second half of the nucleus can be done by the modified peripheral chop where we do not take the chopper underneath the rectus, but start the chopping by pulling the periphery of the nucleus out. So I'll show you some of the videos. So this is a divide and conquer, we make a trench. So the trench has to go up to the uh, rectus margin, don't have to go beyond that. And usually trench, I usually prefer to make slightly paracentral initial trench and then widen it. So once you widen it, you can rotate it. Either you can rotate it full 180 degree and deepen that trench then start making other, or you just rotate 90 degree and start making some trenches over here. So once you are made, so you make a cross, so keep on making this trench. And again in this, most of the time you will have to be deeper at the center. Now once these four small, small trenches are made, then you need to split it and see that this part was not deep enough where we started. And the Kenman tip is very, very useful for making trenches. You can see the bright reflex. Now we can put uh, two instruments over there and separate it. So these four pieces are separated. And once these four pieces are separated, you can pull them into the center and emulsify. So you get a split. Rotate it, split it again. So this is little more time consuming because the pieces are not very small. You are rotating it, trenching it. So once you have got the four pieces done, now once nice separation of the four pieces, so don't have to have very high vacuum, now pull it out, so much more uh, comfortable, and now you take it out, and if this piece is too big, you can divide it further. So the, this way you keep on removing those pieces and suck it out into the central safe zone, so no vacuum emulsification. And before you remove your irrigation, put on a viscoelastic, Throughout the surgery, you should maintain the chamber depth irrespective of the type of the catheter. As soon as your regression, you are about to withdraw, put the viscoelastic from the side port. So this is now direct peripheral chop. Some of them bury it directly into the uh, high vacuum setting. I usually prefer to have a small trench so that I can go into the depth of the nucleus. At times, you are not able to go to the depth of the nucleus. Then you take your chopper into the periphery, now create a vacuum seal, pull it towards the tip and move it sideways to increase the split. So this is a classical peripheral chop. You can see there is a blunt chopper. We bury it, we go, we make it vertical, pull towards the tip, moves, move sideways. So keep on chopping like this till you have made approximately six pieces of the nucleus and again go there make the tip vertical and move the sideways. You can move the, uh, the nucleus which you are holding or you can move the chopper or you can move both of them. If by any chance you are not getting the split complete, reposition the chopper where you want to split the fiber. So keep on doing it till you have got the. So this is a uh, modified peripheral chop. So where you can just after having the initial few chops, and once you have got some uh, space in the eye. So this is the peripheral chop where you are going underneath and pulling it. This chopper is underneath the rectus margin and you split it. So instead of doing that, what you can also do is if your machine is good, you can pull this periphery out. Now the nucleus periphery is out and you can chop it over here. So you don't have to negotiate the chopper inside. 
pull the periphery out and then chop it. And usually in the second half, or once half of the nucleus is gone and you can do that. So on the other hand, central chop, So you just keep your chopper, don't have to negotiate the chopper underneath the rectus margin, hold it, bury it and separate it and reposition the chopper where you want to separate the fibers. So if you get a split, don't keep on uh, pushing it to the periphery. So keep on burying it over there, close to the tip on the left hand side and then split it. So just bury it vertically down and keep on splitting it. This is called central chop and usually works very well up to grade 4, grade 5 at times it becomes very, very difficult to bury and crack. So stop and chop, I will show you the universal irrespective of the density of the cataract, easy to master, excellent control, mostly predictable, reproducible even with low end machine. And most importantly, energy used for making trench causes no collateral damage. So this is a stop and chop. So we remove part of the nucleus, this is a soft cataract. So you just make a trench, go there, and because this is a soft cataract, not so wide trench, not so long trench, not so deep trench is needed. Just a small trenching, three, four passes, and you can easily separate it without any problem. And rest of the chopping, then you can continue. So they, I think most of the resident get the soft cataract to operate, and they usually cause PCR very common. In a normal cataract, we nudge the nucleus in effect foot pedal position 2, bury the FACO tip in foot position pad 3, hold the nucleus by vacuum seal and pull it out, chop and pull it out. What happens in a softer cataract, there is very poor hold. If you keep a low vacuum setting, you are not able to hold it. If you keep a high vacuum setting, it gets sucked in then and there. And there is a sticky EP nucleus which does not allow the nucleus to collapse. And in the process, you just suck it into the peripheral unsafe zone and you cause a PCR. So in this case, so what you should do is, the best method is that you take a FACO tip and keep it close to the rectus margin and remove part of the anterior epinucleus plate up to the delineation line between the anterior capsular rim and anterior surface of the nucleus. So what I'm doing is, I'm just sucking out the epinucleus. No PACO energy, just keep on sucking, keep on sucking. At 270 degree, you can very easily suck. Once you do that, the stickiness of the epinucleus, which is holding back the nucleus, is gone. After this, either you can lift whole of the soft nucleus in total up, or you can use a stop and chop, divide into two, and this will prolapse very easily. So whenever there is a soft cataract, remove part of the ep ep epinucleus, and then you can very easily can prolapse this and suck it out. Just one or two minutes more. So once we are operating a hard cataract, in hard cataract I usually prefer to see a V, a white trench because the sleeve is much wider and I do hydro dissection after making 80, 90 percent of the trench. Initial hydro was not done, in a hard cataract this keeps on rotating, you are not able to make a trench. And then after making most of the trench, which is very wide, and then I go and rotate the nucleus. And after splitting it, most of the time the, there is a posterior lathery plate which will not allow it to split. So what I'm going to do is I'm holding one end of the heminucleus with the six-handed vacuum just at the periphery, and then just separate like this. And you will see that the nice trench is taking place. So in a harder cataract, use the high setting after making the remake a wide trench and a split from the periphery by holding. Do not try to pull in the center where the lady plates are. Separate from the periphery, it will automatically go into the center. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Arvind Lal. Uh, beautiful uh, teaching videos. We all understand how it ha effectively it has to be divided and then conquered and emulsified. Dr. Harvans Lal is currently a vice president of our society, uh, All India Ophthalmological Society. 
and he's going to take over as a president very, very soon. And I understand he'll make a lot of differences for a young people like you sitting here. And I wish uh, his tenure becomes very, very good for our society. Thank you, Dr. Harvans, for uh, making such a nice presentation. Now we'll shift to a, uh, back to the you know, uh, capsular rexis. How to perfect your uh, capsular rexis with uh, Dr. Satyajit Sinha I'm going to talk about. Uh, he's our friend from uh, Bihar, Patna. He also represents uh, ARC from the west, uh, east zone. Done uh, wonderful work for a PG teaching. He is one of the widely known person for a PG teaching and appreciate his contribution also. Dr. Satyajit, you'll hear a one bell when one minute is there. After that, there'll be a final bell. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, a very good morning to all of you. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking in front of Professor Jeevan Titiyal, sir, who operates on the Prime Ministers and Presidents of India. <laughs> uh, it's an absolute honor. And, and you are lucky to be uh, here uh, right in front of him. So, how many of you are doing phacoid multiplication or have started doing? Okay, so about half the people are doing and half will be doing shortly. One of the most important things is the making of the rexis. If you have lost it, at least as a beginner, then it's very difficult to complete the phacoid multiplication. Later, when you become experienced like Professor Titial, then even if the rexis runs away, then you will be able to do phacoid multiplication. But when you become Professor Titial, the rexis will not run away. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll begin with my basic video first, in which I want you to show that every step that you are doing is very, very important. And because most of us, including me, I cannot afford a femtosecond uh, rexis, sorry, a, a femtosecond uh, rexis uh, marker. So this marker was made by one of our friends who sadly we lost recently, Dr. Ajay Paul, who we, we the, this marker we keep on the cornea and it acts as a guide and it's there for two, three minutes so it doesn't leave a mark. Now, this will help you in making the mark which is there. A lot of theoretical talk is there, but when you are actually doing it, your whole goal is that you should make a proper rexis. Now, even when you are making the parasynthesis, it should not be too short or it should not be too small. Now, this incision that you are making is very, very important. Now, how far you have to go and how stable it should be, it's easier said than done when you are beginning. Suddenly, if you make a small incision, there will be leakage of viscoelastic and that will also affect your rexis. If you make it too long, that will also affect your astigmatism. So a good guide may be to make a square incision. And how will you make a square incision? This line that you see on the uh, keratome, you can use it as a marker first. Make a small mark over here, a very small mark, just to let you know till how far to go. And then once you put it inside, and as Dr. Anaga Harur said, you can make a multiplanar incision. You go in and then you dimple it in and then you put it inside. Every step that you do will affect your rexis. Now then you go ahead and you make the main port. A lot of people do it from the side port so that less viscoelastic is leaked. A lot of people do it from the main incision. Now, even this, you will see that I am tilting the sister tome and going inside. Don't go straight inside, otherwise you will scratch the uh, incisions that you have made. Every time you are going inside and coming outside, these are very small steps which you have to take care of. You tilt the uh, cystotome and then come out and then go in. So this is how you go in and then you make a central rexis and then you start the 
um, sharing technique which Dr. Anaga was talking about and you will see that from very close by I am trying to pull it. You shouldn't pull from far. And then in that case you will be able to make this rexis. And even if you are doing a small incision cataract surgery today, imagine to yourself that you are going to do a phaco emulsification and even in a small incision cataract surgery, try to make a bigger rexis and if you have to extend it for prolapsing the nucleus, do it, but initially try to make, for every case, make a rexis, imagining that you are going to do a phaco emulsification on this case. Now, once you have done that, we'll come to a little bit of theory. What are the types of rexis that is there? One is manual, which we are doing. One is a zeptorexis, and one is a femtorexis, which has come in vogue now. And the limitations of the femto is that if it's post-traumatic, if the anterior capsular is fibrotic, then the femto will not be able to work. And now, these days, for beginners as it is making an anterior capsulotomy, anterior exit is difficult, but now with experience, teachers like Professor Titial, if inadvertently by mistake there's a posterior capsule rupture, you can make a rexis also out of it so that the bag, so that the IUL is in the bag and it's stable, but you cannot use this femto laser for making a posterior rexis. Now there are times when you have used Trifan Blue, you have followed the book, you are doing everything, but the rexis still runs away. You are worried, you have promised the patient a good IUL, everything is there, but the rexis is running away. Do not bring your ego in between. Use the vana scissors, cut it open, and do what you have to do rightly next. Now, there are situations where no matter how hard you try, how good you are, it will run away. Now, while that can happen while doing anterior capsulotomy and while doing posterior capsulotomy also. Now, there are two types of uh, rexis runaways. One is the predictable. If we are doing in a pediatric cataract, the capsule is so strong that it will run away. And in unpredictable, just like Dr. Uh, Anaga Harur was showing, that suddenly it ran away. And sometimes when you just put a nick, you have not even started the surgery, you just put a nick and the rexis runs away. And then that is the unpredictable one. However, if you use high molecular viscoelastics, and there are other ways of doing it, that you can almost 90% of the times now prevent an Argentinian flag. What is the physics happening behind it? There are two primarily things which is happening. One is the vitreous thrust, which is also from behind. If the eyeball is not soft enough, and initially all of you may be doing um, under peribulbar block, and the intralenticular pressure per se also may be high so that uh, uh, it can affect your axis. So there are two physics mechanisms uh, uh, going on if it's going to run away. Now there are different situations like in hypermature intumescent cataract, raised vitreous thrust, and faulty primary incisions like I said earlier. There are other situations also, the, you have given the block, everything is all right, but still the patient is uncooperative, moving the head, so on and so forth. And at times there may be poor visibility through the cornea also. However, in your microscope, if you use retroillumination now, it's much easier to see the rexis margin than do a capsular axis. There are other situations also like in Marfan syndrome, where the length is subluxated. You still have to do a rexis. There is, there is in pseudo-exfoliation syndrome when they, where there is zonular dehiscence or dialysis. There may be small pupil, there may be floppy recurrent prolapsing iris, iphis, where you have to manage the iris also and you have to complete your rexis also. Now the rexis may be accidentally torn also. You have completed everything, you have done well, but still while putting a third parasynthesis, you can hurt the rexis margin. When inserting or removing the iris hooks, sometimes you'll use the expander, that time you can hurt the rexis margin. Or you have made a trench and you have gone so far ahead that you go and hit the anterior capsule and that can also hurt the rexis. So every point of the time you have to be careful throughout the surgery. It's very important that you keep a high molecular weight, uh, high molecular weight OVD in the operating room. With, when you're using the cystotome, it's, there is less leakage of the viscoelastic. You use a 26-gate needle. 
but you should also keep a utrata forceps if you feel it's running away, fill the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber and use your utrata forceps to pull it back. It will always be good, even if you have a good retro illumination in the beginning and you have a good red reflex to use a trifan blue uh, to see the anterior capsule. Now, I will show you a case, and particularly I want to show, it, to show you this, that no matter how hard I try, I am not able to open this anterior capsule. And you will come across such situations in your uh, entire career that uh, you have promised a, a high-end lens to a patient, and you have the you are not able to complete the primary uh, procedure of making a rexis. So you will see I am using a cystotome, making a neck, I am trying to use a, a rexis forceps, I am not able to do it. So I will move the video a little further. You will see here that I am putting a lot of stress on the zonules, which is not good. That is not the right way to be doing it. So I go to the periphery also and search if I can make a nick somewhere to make this rexis. And eventually I have put so much stress on the zonules that I do not want to bring my ego in between because at a later stage I may lose the entire bag or the capsule. So first of all I make myself safe and convert to small incision cataract surgery. And then I make nicks, and I'm still trying to search if I can make a rexis out of this. So you will see that I'm trying to pull hard, but I still can't find the edge where it is. So now in this case, you will see that finally in the periphery, I found where the capsule will open from. And from there, I use a rexis forceps and complete this procedure. So these are things which you have to keep in mind and now I'm very safe in my heart and mind that I'm not going to hurt the patient's eye and I'm going to complete this rexis and uh, put the IUL in the bag. For beginners, it's important that you do under peribulbar block. It helps in softening the eye and it helps in easier management of the complications. In case of additional vitreous thrust, you can soft soften the eyeball with the mannitol and always use a high molecular OVD as I said earlier. In intumescent cataracts, it may be a good idea to put a nick in the center and remove the milky fluid that is there and then do the rexis. Uh, as I said, you can use trifan blue. Uh, in intumescent cataract, as Dr. Anaga was showing, make a small rexis first and then you can complete it. When there is liquefied cortex and an inadvertent extension of the rexis, liquefied cortex is aspirated first before initiating phacomalcification. This is the small rexis that was there. So for paucity of time, I'll stop here, but you have to take extreme care throughout the rest of the procedure. Um, if the rexis runs away, complete the procedure from the opposite direction and undue pressure on the posterior capsule is to be avoided. Post rexis runaway, hydro dissection has to be done carefully, prolapse the nucleus into the anterior chamber and phaco done between the layers with viscoelastic and some advocate converting to a can opener just like I showed just now. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. Excellent presentation, Dr. Satyajit sir, as always. And uh, definitely, I think all the um, uh, students here are going to go back and practice their capsulotomies in all their cases. So whether to make a small capsular excess or a large capsular excess, that is also very important. Especially, uh, in, uh, Dr. Neeraj, sir, if you are ready, you can please come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So basically, in when you're doing a capsule or excess, what are the few important points that you need to remember is the anterior chamber should be well maintained and the anterior capsule should be flat. The moment there is a bulge, it's convex, especially in intumescent cataracts where the intralenticular pressure is more, you have to go back, wait, push in more viscoelastic, flatten it and only then do. So when you do it from the side port, then it is better so that there is less leakage. And even in between, whenever you are making the rexis, if you feel that it's going out, stop, push in viscoelastic in the periphery, not in the center. The capsule is like a cellophane sheet, you know, and there are many forces acting. It's not just the surgeon's uh, tip of the needle. It's also the zonular fibers 
which have a centrifugal effect. So you have to overcome all that and the vector force of your movement has to be such that it is circular and it is not going into the periphery. That is important. Thank so you. Uh, uh, we now like to welcome Dr. Neeraj Kungar, who's come from Ajmer and uh, he's our uh, RPC alumni and MSUNIN also. And uh, he's uh, one of the leading practitioner in the uh, entire area of uh, that part of country and very well renowned uh, speaker, faculty in any national forums. Dr. Neeraj is going to cover about the basics of intraocular lenses, which has changed the concept of a cataract surgery, not only from our point of view, for a patient point of view to get a, apart from getting a good vision, the quality of vision and quality of life has changed after IVF. Dr. Neeraj, please. At the outset, I like to thank Dr. Santosh, Dr. Maipal, Dr. Ritika, Dr. Rolika, and entire team iFocus for giving me this opportunity to come to this forum. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Tetyal, Dr. Anaga, and my dear friends, I'll be talking on basics of IOL design. So next 15 minutes, we'll be navigating through history and theory, practically available IOLs, and I'll be just going through four or five surgical situations and then we'll discuss which is the best design suited for such surgical situations. So coming to history, uh, Italian scientist Stadini in mid 18th century first considered IOL implantation. In 1795, it was Casamata who implanted glass IOL which sank posteriorly. And then it was English ophthalmologist Sir Nicholas Harold Ridley who is credited for first successful IOL implantation on November 29, 1949. So these are the various generation of lenses, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. Now we are into sixth, seventh, and eighth generation. That is the foldable, premium, and fake IOLs. And coming to classification of IOL, the classification based on designs can be done on the position where it is put, that is capsular bag, ciliary sulcus, scleral fixation, iris fixation, angle supported material, design, whether it is three-piece or one-piece lens, optical shape, biconvex, planoconvex, optical function, whether it is spherical, aspheric, multifocal, toric, edof lens, haptic properties, optic color, type of packaging, whether it is a preloaded or a non-preloaded lens. So just brief about generation one, it was biconvex, PMMA, PCIOL, and the complications were inferior and posterior decentration, inflammation, scandry glaucoma, because the size was very, very large, 8.32 millimeters optic. Then generation two, the whole uh, thing shifted to anterior chamber. So we were in the posterior chamber beginning, and then it shifted to anterior chamber because the fixation of lens was in angle recess. There were less chances of decentration, uh, decentration decreased reaction. But the complications were corneal, corneal decompensation, uveitis, scandry glaucoma, UGH syndrome. Then we came to third generation, that was the iris supported or iris fixated lenses. The third generation, again, the complication was iris chafing, pupillary distortion, chronic inflammation, CME, endothelial decompensation. These were the generation three lenses. Then came generation four. Again, anterior chamber IOL, which was improvised. So these are the different choice model, Mark III, Mark, uh, Mark VIII, Mark IX, but it is the Kelman Multiflex, which is still in use, and when needed, many a times we still use it. So generation five, again, everything came back to PCIOL. Where we started, we are back there because the advantage of the position, advantage of the physiological position. So these were rigid tripod designs, J-loop, C-loop, C-loop PCIOL, one-piece PCIOL, and then, as we all know, the advantages of in the bag placement, it is the proper anatomic size, minimal magnification, low incidence of lens decentration and dislocation, but the complications, PCO, photic effects, higher order abrasions, capsular contraction, requirement of glasses for near. So now, to take care of these complications, we improvised on the designs, we improvised on the material, and we added asphericity, accommodation, and thus better designs were needed for this. So material used is PMMA, that was the rigid material used, still PMMA lenses are being used in camp surgeries and all, then flexible material, silicone, hydrophobic acrylic and hydrophilic acrylic. 
PMMA, as I said, it is a rigid, inert, non-autoclavable. Uh, non this is the first material used. Disadvantages are rigid and require large incision. This can be used in anterior chamber IOLs and posterior chamber IOLs. Then silicone is a polymer of silicon and oxygen. The advantages are less chances of PCO, good resistance for ND YAG, but disadvantages were more chances of dislocation, anterior capsule rim opacify quickly, glistening, and cannot be used in silicon filled eyes and high myopic eyes, and it favors bacterial adherence. So now we are into acrylic IOLs, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic is a mixture of HEMA and hydrophilic acrylic monomer. Here the risk of PCO is high. Hydrophobic is the one that we are uh, uh, opting for now and is, it is of the choice. Copolymer of acrylate and methacrylate, it has good resistance of YAG laser and risk of PCO is low. Then coming on haptic material, PMMA, proline, PVDF, polyamide, P PES. Now coming to the designs, like the basic topic that I have, I have covered the history part. The designs are basically, IOL is composed of three parts, optic, optic edge design and haptic. So optics, we have biconvex, planoconvex, spheric, aspheric, enhanced monofocal, enhanced toric, bifocal, trifocal, EDOF, and now CRV lensium, lenses. That comes by the name Technic Synergy. Optic edge designs, I'll be covering that. Haptic, we have loop haptic, plate haptic, quadruple haptics, renal design, dual haptics. So optic designs, the conventional spherical IOL, the biconvex IOL exhibits positive spherical abrasion. It adds to the positive spherical abrasion to the already positive corneal spherical abrasion. But let me add here that in older patients, my personal experience is that they have a better near and distance vision, the very old people with spherical as compared to the uh, aspheric lenses. Because of the spherical abrasions, they are able to have a larger focus basically. So to overcome these problems of spherical lenses, we came out with aspheric lenses. These are basically of two types, negative spherical abrasions. We induce negative spherical abrasions and to uh, basically balance the normally positive corneal abrasion. And second is a zero or minimal spherical abrasions lens. So aspheric IELTS attempt to improve pseudophagic vision by controlling spherical abrasions. And aspheric IELTS anterior prolate surface is stacnase, posterior prolate surface is acrisoft IQ by Alcon, and both anterior and posterior prolate surface is acrius AO by Bosch and Norm. Now coming to optic design, the optic has to be designed in such a way that we have minimum glare and halos, we have minimum PCO rate. So we have a rounded anterior edge which can reduce internal reflections. The sloping side edge minimizes the potential for edge glare. And the scare posterior edge facilitates 360 degree capsular contact. So edge designs as I have already discussed that uh, plate haptic designs, the haptic is plate haptic, loop haptic, C loop or J loop, modified C loop, plate loop. The different types of haptic angulations are relative to the plane of optics for PCIUL. We have a 10 degree anterior angulation design to keep the optic part away from the pupil. For ACIUL, we have posteriorly angulated lens to vault the IUL away from the pupil. So these are the various designs you can see, C loop, J loop and then the downwards are there. That is the Kelman multiflex. That is in the last row first, then iris fixated, sulcus IOL. And these are the different designs. Now coming to premium IOLs, the details I think will be covered. The clinical part will be covered by Dr. Tetal. So I'll just go through it very uh, fast. Multifocal accommodated, accommodative IOLs, toric multi uh, monofocal, multifocal, EDOF, trifocal, and CRV. So multifocal IOL, the concept was by Hofer. It is of refractive, diffractive, or combination of both. The anterior surface have ring or sector-shaped optical zones with different dioptic power. Initially, it was silicon IOLs, array multifocal IOLs. We used to implant that in early 2001-2002. And then acrylic came by the name Rezoom and Preziol. Then came diffractive IOLs, principally utilizes diffraction in conjunction with refraction to create a new foci. The examples are Technis multifocal, uh, 
एक्रिस ऑफ एक्रिस ऑफ रेस्टोर एल्कोन रेस्टोर डिफ्रेक्टिव पावर दे एड पावर कैन बी अप टू फ्रॉम प्लस फोर टू प्लस थ्री प्लस टू पॉइंट फाइव डिफरेंस मॉडल्स आर अवेलेबल सो कमिंग टू रिफ्रैक्टिव वर्सेज डिफ्रैक्टिव रिफ्रैक्टिव इज एक्सीलेंट इंटरमीडिएट एंड डिस्टेंस विजन बट दी पेशेंट हु रीड फॉर प्रोलॉन्ग पीरियड्स ऑफ टाइम और इन पुअर लाइटिंग मे एक्सपीरियंस आई फेटिक इट इज पीपल डिपेंडेंट एंड इन डिफ्रैक्टिव इट इज एक्सीलेंट रीडिंग विजन एंड वेरी गुड डिस्टेंस विजन बट फेयर इंटरमीडिएट विजन so patients who do lot of computer work may not accept it at all so it is lens dependent on pupil the disadvantages of multifocal iols are contrast sensitivity glare and halos it has uh, it improves with bilateral implantation because of summation effect and it also requires visuo cortical neuro adaptation multifocal iols then this basically it is bifocal that we call multifocal but then we came with newer designs of trifocal where addition of intermediate vision was also done then edof lenses they decrease the glare and halos and crv is the latest added that is continuous range of vision lens technis synergy so bifocal iol it is the atlisa by uh, yais and then it is then we came to trifocal iol again carl jais atlisa tri 839 mp and acris of iq pan optics lens so the first one is the by jais that is the plate haptic and the second one is by uh, elcon that is pan optics then we came to edof lenses edof lenses create a single elongated focal point to enhance depth of focus uh, it has diffractive and non diffractive diffractive is technis symphony and non diffractive is acris of iq vbt which has been recently approved by fda in 2020 it's a very good lens uh, it has x wave technology that stresses and splits the light without splitting it but the problem of chromatic abrasion is there this is the symphony design then now we have continuous range of vision technis synergy which decreases your near point up to 33 cm then toric iols are astigmatic correcting iols another design where we can correct the astigmatism also the first toric was introduced by shimizu and but here patient selection iol selection post op lens stability are the key features to success uh, two types silicon acrylic we are mainly using acrylic that is the acrylic soft toric and technis toric and we have now uh, t flex rainer also available and acri comfort by yais and we have toric lenses in multifocal now synergy toric has also come and i hence toric has also come that is the enhanced mono vision lens so accommodative lenses they change position inside the eye so these are alka lens iol curvature change iol these are different types but the disadvantages are smaller optic more abrasions fibrosis capsular opacification thus presently out of bulk commercial use then piggy back iol when the iol is placed over the other iol whenever it is needed the complication is red rock syndrome that is the intral lenticular opacification and iridia iols rollable iols new iols for amd and recent advantages uh, advances will be light adjustable iol telescopic iol and electronic iol now coming to surgical situations we have a pcr we have a intact Anterior capsule. Anyone, which particular lens we should implant here? So three-piece lens with reverse optic capture. So this is the ideal lens. So when we know the designs, we know in certain surgical uh, problems, whenever we land up in, in a problem, how to deal that. So both anterior and posterior capsules are ruptured. So we have different options. We have sulcus fixated, which can be done by glued. Yeah, mane, and now we have this posterior iris fixated lens again, a very good lens, and <coughs> it is forgiving also and very good, very easy learning curve here. And then anterior chamber cal Kalman multiplex is anyway there. Now a patient comes with negative dysphotopsia. You have operated one eye, and for six months, patient is constantly troubling you. I have a black shadow. I have a black shadow. What to do? So what will you do? Which type of lens or how you will implant the lens? Any idea? so the basic cause is the distance between the posterior surface of the iris and the anterior surface of the lens when this distance is large then this negative dysphotopsia is occur so we have to decrease this distance either we can do a reverse optic capture of our normal lens 
or we have a masket ND 90S lens, which is a anti dysautopsic lens. This has a groove on anterior optic, captures the capsulotomy. So IOL is fixated by the anterior capsule, thus decreasing the, the distance that I was talking about. That is the posterior surface of, of iris to the anterior surface of the lens. So multifocal IOL implanted and you get a post-operative plus two diopter surprise. Any IOL that you can use here? You can put a sulcoflex piggyback IOL by Raynard. So thus different designs of IOLs help us give the best to our patient and it is very important for us to be well aware about the different design IOLs available to us. Thank you, I am available on Khungar Eye Care and this is my WhatsApp number. Excellent presentation, Dr. Neeraj sir, and that was very, very comprehensive description of all the different kinds of lenses. As he very rightly said, you need to know what to use where, and that will help you to give your best visual outcomes to your patients. So I'd like to now invite our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Jeevan Titial sir. He is the chief and professor at the RP Center, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, one of the most senior and the most experienced surgeon, brilliant academician and excellent teacher, and most importantly, a very humble and a nice person. So he would be speaking to us on premium lenses, aspheric IOLs, multifocals, edofs, and trifocals, finding the right fit. So today, all of our patients are more demanding. They want best vision, they don't want glasses, and sir is going to tell you all how and which lens to select. Over to you, sir. Good morning, uh, students and uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anaga, for a nice introduction. And I see, you know, uh, people sitting since morning because it was an early beginning for all of us. And Dr. Neeraj covered the entire range of IOL, the history of, uh, of IOL, how it generated through the various uh, uh, modification which could be done in intraocular lenses. And I'm going to take you through the, the current practices which we do for our patients, which are those lenses which will actually give the, the desired quality of vision for our patients. So those will be aspheric IOLs, which is very commonly used, or uh, now, the premium IOLs basically looking for a multifocal IOLs to give access to not only to a patient coming for cataract surgery, for those group of patients who we term as a press biopic IOLs. That means they have either early onset cataract or they are fed up with their press biopic corrections and people come for uh, these surgeries also. You people are there in a stage where you still have a cataract as a major load for us. If you look into a blindness category, Almost 60% of cases are, you know, because of cataract. That is less than 3 by 60. And see how many patients will be there between 66 to 6, uh, 360. It's a huge number. But the other addition which you're going to face in next 5, 10, 20 years is press biopia. How are we going to correct press biopia? And today, if you look into various options, the refractive option on a cornea, the uh, uh, surgeries may not be perfect. And it seems that lens-based surgery may be a better option for press biopic uh, people also. Therefore, the lenses has to be better and better to give, you the, give the quality of vision for these young people, not only for that particular day or year, maybe for another 20, 25, 30 years. If you operate a person at the age of 45 or 55, he's going to live for another 30 years. So to make that lens work effectively for 30 is a challenge because the posterior capsule opacification is a major challenge for us after cataract surgery, and till date we have no solution for that. Dr. Kungar talked about the various lenses. One of the important things is uh, knowing the aberration of eye, which we uh, are now aware of. We, you can customize the aberration of a person and get a customized IOL for that person also. That may be future. If I know what is my aberration, especially the corneal aberration, then plan your surgery accordingly to neutralize that aberration. You all know cornea is a aspheric, but it has a positive spherical aberration. That is normally counteracted by the negative sphericity of the crystalline lens. So you become a neutral and you see better. But if you see here, as the age advances, the lens also become positive. So you have positive, positive, and creates a more spherical aberration. Your quality of vision goes down. 
So that is what I'm saying. If you have a device which can access the aberration type and the amount of a cornea, we can customize the lens to improve the quality of vision. So how do we tackle these aberration which in the cornea? Because lens aberration which you are neutralizing has been taken away by our cataract surgery. We have a spherical eye wheels, which are the initial generation lenses. They used to further induce the spherical aberration. The spherical a thing was the major concern, though we had an aspheric eye wheel, which Neeraj talked about. And one of the first lens was the Technis eye wheel, which came with the aspheric design to neutralize the spherical aberration. And there was a standard way to look into around 0.27 would be the corneal aberration. So minus 0.27 was the aspheracity in a Technis lenses to counteract that aspheracity. Then you had an aberration neutral because if you have a negative aspheric lens, they did have optical problems also. Then came the aspheric balance curve designs, which could neutralize the decentration which may happen in these lenses. If you see here, these patients with the negative aspheric lenses are sensitive to a decentration happening. And the latest generation of our monofocal lenses now is called enhanced monofocal lenses. Those are Technis eye hand lenses or a BBT lenses. They are basically monofocal lenses, but they have an en enhanced technology to improve beyond the, the distant visual acuity you see clear. So some sort of an intermediate visual acuity will also come. So they come into a category of enhanced monofocal lenses. So this is what I uh, talked about, spherical aberration. Now if you look at negative aspheric lenses, which are commonly used, if you are looking for all lenses which are commonly used monofocal lenses, they are a negative aspheric lens. So they will be either minus 0 0.15, 0 0.18, 0 0.21, or minus 0 0.27, depending on the type of IOS you are using. But these lenses are sensitive to decentration. If the lens decenters from the optical axis, so the decentration and negative aspheric lenses will induce further coma and trefoil. So this is important. These lenses have to be well centered in terms of a the visual axis of patient. So if you have a patient with a higher uh, alpha angle, so these lenses may create a problem sometimes if you have a larger angle which is more than 500. So this is important to know the entire optics of the eye. Multifocal eye holes, he did cover nearest and now we are in the newer generation multifocal eye holes. They are basically trifocal lenses, gives you a range of vision right from the distance clear acuity to intermediate to near. And which can also be compounded by extended range of vision, which gives you a, a focus which is extended and decreases the, uh, the photoptic symptom in these cases. This is Technis uh, hand lens, which is basically aspheric anterior surface, which, which gives you a better quality of vision. And it also corrects the achromatic chroma, chromatic aberration also. This is Neeraj talked about, the new generation uh, BBT lens, which is basically the technology which splits the you know, uh, wavefront into two and gives a very smooth transition of rays to give a smooth elongated focus which is near, intermediate and distance. The two surfaces transition is basically by the X-wave pattern which is basically wavefront technology which will be used to decrease the halos and glare which is a major concern for uh, any optical device. Not only the intraocular lenses, any optical device will have some sort of optical phenomena. To decrease that, various things has to be done, and this wavefront technology has been used in a various telescopic devices to decrease those optical phenomena. The other important thing to look into any IOL, especially for a, if you look for a press biopic correcting IOL, we are looking for near correction. So, how much is the near correction you can achieve with a particular lens can be judged by defocus curve. The defocus curve is basically to titrate the visual acuity. You correct the patient for a distant visual acuity with the refractive correction. Then go from the minus to plus lenses to see how much is the defocus patient can tolerate to see that amount. So if you have a minus plus uh, 2.5 defocus or minus 2 or 2.5, 2.5 defocus is around 40 centimeters. The patient will be seeing clearly at 40 centimeters. The defocus curve is the sort of a simulation of how much uh, amount of a vision will be there with these lenses in a patient's own uh, understanding. So if you compare defocus curve of IHANS and BBT lenses, they are better than a monofocal lenses. And they also give a little bit of uh, intermediate vision, which is around 1.5. If you want to see a near vision clearly, patients should be reaching up to minus 2.5, which will be seen with the trifocal lenses or bifocal lenses. So you have a trifocal lens with a three distinct foci, that is distance, intermediate, and near. 
and that should be titrated not only for a focus wise we are looking for a light transmission through those three foci should be adequate enough to give a clear vision clarity of vision is basically depends on a, the transmission of light through the each focus points this is what i'm going to cover subsequently also if you see here alcon uh, panoptic lens which has around 80 as 8% light transmission and if looking at the focus distance intermediate near and the focus would be dependent on to the the range of uh, uh, you can say extended range which can be given from the intermediate to near so if i see intermediate which can be 60 to 80 cm and near can be 33 to 40 cm that has to be covered very effectively <coughs> if you can see uh, from 80 to 40 cm that will give a extended range of vision for patient this is a comparative chart you can just see this these are three major trifocal lenses which are practiced we are looking to panoptics fine with fijol or atlisa from jais they all are acrylic materials they do have a good uh, depth of focus in all three ranges most important if you look in this area the light transmission wise they are all equal 85 86 88% but see the distribution of light 50% of the distance which is equal for all of them but see the intermediate and near if you see here intermediate is 17% and 34 for near so this lens will do better for near than intermediate this lens has a equal division of a light transmission for a intermediate to near so this is a lens going to give a equal vision quality for a intermediate to distant uh, near that is very very important to realize and the effective correction is around 3.25 which is good for all lenses so these are important parameter which should be seen and the diffractive zone is also important if you see here these are 6 mm diffractive zone this is a 4.5 mm diffractive zone that also gives a access for the other area which is going to improve the distant vision also to so just see this uh, technology which neeraj talked about the edof lenses or extension depth of focus lenses they basically which gives a elongated focus happening because of uh, the design per se this technis has a proprietary diffractive etchinet uh, design apart from that it also correct the chromatic aberrations and the focus is elongated here mainly because of uh, aspherific anterior surface modification happening these patient Technic Synergy is combination of uh, the Symphony lens they had and the the other technology which you you have in in terms of a uh, Edof uh, lens. So Edof plus the their bifocal lens, which are Technic multifocal, gives you increase in the uh, near vision also because Symphony never gave a good near vision. I'll show the defocus curve of that. So if you look into a Symphony lens, the defocus curve suddenly goes down because it doesn't give a good near vision. intermediate is quite okay if you see this is the intermediate range the monofocal is slightly lower this is better with a symphony lens and better with other eye hans and bvt lenses but if you look in near which is around uh, 3 2.5 to 3 diopter which is best with a synergy and panoptics so symphony per se though it had extended range of vision lens but never gave a good near vision therefore they looked into adding the another technology into that that is multifocal lens which gives a better near vision for these patient this is talking about a one eye if you have a bilateral surgery to be done you can mix and match also you can think of a little bit of monovision uh, criteria for those cases also just to summarize the optics part of these lenses i have covered the entire optics briefly so you can go through this monofocal aspheric lenses have a aspheric technology they'll have a one single uh, focal point that is infinity if a monofocal eye hans uh, lenses they have a higher order aspheric surface like and they'll give you some sort of intermediate vision apart from distance non diffractive edof lenses that is bvt based on a wavefront technology it gives you enhanced depth of focus around 50 to 60 cm which is better than a little better than eye hans lenses trifocal lenses they have a three distinct foci but if you look into a panoptic lenses it is a basically quadifocal lens made into trifocal and gives you a very nice range of vision from 40 to 120 cm other combination like i talked about synergy lens combined both and better to have a slightly more reading capacity depending on patient's requirement also pre op assessment i think this was covered in the beginning dry eye assessment and uh, rule out comorbidities 
look for a high myopia, amblyopia. These are a poor outcome for these patients. Biometry has to be done appropriately. Look for a good correction. Depending on the IUL, you choose for a least myopic or hematropic power in these cases. Always look for a astigmatism because astigmatism is the one post-op uh, refractive error a patient has is a major cause of dissatisfaction for these patients. And if you're looking at multifocal lenses, as I talked about in the beginning also, don't only check the anterior part of a cornea, look for a posterior corneal curvature also, because that can especially modify. You all understand posterior corneal curvature is always against the rule, anterior may be with the rule, against the rule. If both are against the rule, then you're going to give a under correction with these patients. You see this patient, if you just look into anterior now, total curvature is 1.18. It's a good case for a toric IOL. But if you see only the anterior curvature is 0.89, you might not like to put toric IOLs. So this makes a difference. That this is a patient only with anterior, I thought of a T3, but when look for total keratometry, patient requires T4, and the residual cylinder is now with T4.02, which is acceptable. And with T3, it is 0.55. Patient with a trifocal lens may not be very happy with the near and intermediate vision for these patients. This I covered. So you have to look into corneal aberrations. Poor corneal aberration cases are not good for a premium IOLs, though you can put in these patients also. So this is a summary for a pre-op workup. Has to understand the requirement of patient. Very, very important. And accordingly, choose the IOL for your cases. Treat pre-existing dry eyes. Little, uh, always consider, if patient has a toric IOL, more than 0.75, Premium IOL, multifocal, trifocal has to be put in these cases. Ocular aberration has to be checked for all cases. Which IOL to choose? If you are looking for multifocal consideration, patient requirement, ocular factors, patient personality is very, very important for these cases. Just see her active life, agreeable personality, because personality is also very important. Some patients are very, very demanding, and most patients will come with a lot of ideas. They have gone through the internet, and they know various IOLs and they demand, I want this. But he or she may not be suitable for that. So you have to very aggressively counsel that patient to demotivate or motivate for a particular IOL. The Technic Symphony is a good lens where patient doesn't require a lot of reading uh, as such. And if you have patient requirement reading, then you have to look for trifocal. Alcon BBT is another range of lens which is equally good for a patient who are driving in the night time because these lenses may not have a halos and other criteria associated with these lenses. I normally take patients with a lot of reading requirement, age more than 70, 75, trifocal lenses are best if they don't have the other added uh, ocular comorbidity, especially diabetic patients, glaucoma patients, or any other corneal pathology like post-refractive surgery patients. This is a brief uh, to assess, as we talked about, one is effective lens position. That is given by the good central capsular axis. If you have femtosecond laser, all is better. Better axis, better centration IOL will give a better effective lens position, which you calculated uh, in your pre-op calculation also. Implantation lens is very effectively done with a good incision. Remove viscoelastic thoroughly from these cases. And if you are using a multifocal toric lenses, you have to align the toricity to your axis. And the central diffractive zone has to be well centered to the visual axis. How do you achieve that? You have the microscopic Parkinson image you can see here. And this should align with the central optical zone of multifocal or a trifocal lens. So these are very, very important point for surgery wise and make sure everything is well connected in these cases. Briefly on a visual outcome, you might be knowing that there are various group studies are seen, but which is the best study to recommend? Any good meta-analysis, especially looked into a case control studies or prospective randomized studies. So these are few of the studies which compared. All IOLs provide good distance visual acuity, but intermediate wise, best at 60 centimeter is synergy and a panoptics. That means these lenses are better than a other lenses which are little compromised. Near vision, again, trifocal lenses overscore these cases. As for the quality of vision concern, again, that will be better with those lenses where you have a better transmission of light. More the transmission, more is the MTF. Stereo acuity is again, another good way to judge because binocularity is the one which will give you a better access to vision. Or these lenses will give you a better binocularity for distance and near by judging the stereo acuity. That test can be done. 
and look for a modulation transfer factor, high order aberration can be seen by various investigative tools. And lastly, the patient satisfaction depends on not only the lens and surgery, depends on how well you have counseled your patient. That is very, very important. And patient with a 6-9 vision may be better off than a patient with 6-5 vision because you have counseled that patient very effectively. Unhappy patients, I talked about, make sure you decrease the photopic symptoms. And that can only happen with a good counseling and giving the time for a neuroadaptation for these patients with little bit of symptom like this. Photic symptoms are there in all lenses, right from monofocal to multifocal. But the quantity may be different and it all depends how tolerant is patient, how effectively you have mobilized your patient. Just to summarize photopic symptoms, as you see here, it is there in every lens. But they are, may not be a truly symptomatic to cause patient concern. And effectively, you can manage these patients. So if you have bit better stereoacuity, better ad adaptation of these patients happen. Therefore, we talk about bilateral implantation of lenses as soon as possible. So you would get a better stereoacuity, binocular vision, and better adaptation for these patients. To summarize, the findings for right fit depends on a pre-op examination and depends on a proper IL selection on a patient's criteria that is requirement, patient examination, findings, and surgical aspects, and your own way to express your quality. This rightly I'll summarize with, kabhi kisi ko mukulmal jaha nahi milta, kahin jami to kahin asma nahi milta. And the search for the right eye will goes on. I hope that in your generation we'll have this good <laughs> lens which can give you like a natural lens. Thank you for kind listening. Excellent presentation, sir, as always, and I think it's more like a textbook. He has put all the scenarios and all the kinds of lenses. So, all I think, uh, like he said, it's very difficult to have the perfect lens like a perfect husband or a perfect wife. So, it's always about a compromise after 40. So, whether you have good distance, definitely, but whether you get good near and what is the trade-off that you have, so you need to talk to the patient, you need to be like a matchmaker, match his requirements with the lens. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd like to now invite our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Krishna Prasad Kudlu. He's a very vast experienced surgeon. He's the medical director of Prasad Netralaya group of hospitals and an excellent surgeon with great clinical skills as well as cataract as well as refractive. So over to you, uh, Dr. Kudlu. Let me ask one question uh, because I think Kudlu is taking time. Anaga, suppose you get a cataract, which lens you'll put in your, get your, uh, for your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I, I, would, I would put a trifocal because uh, I do not want to use glasses for near. And I don't do much of night driving, so even if there is a little bit of glare and halos, I don't, uh, I wouldn't bother about it. Okay, the answer is very correct. It depends on our patient's own uh, requirement. That is the most important thing you have to learn. <laughs> Sir, in my practice, actually, presbyopia is my strength. I've been doing presbyopic uh, uh, surgeries from the different platform. Uh, if the patient, uh, of course, don't have the cataract and eye trace shows that DLI is normal, then I would like to go with the laser refractive surgery. Mainly, I do press beyond. Even up the age of up to 62 to 65, I have done press beyond. And I got a follow up of patients almost around 14 years. There is absolutely no problem. Once again, pre op workup is uh, so important, as you said that, and also about the uh, all the uh, dry workup and everything. Thank you, uh, Kudlu. I, uh, he does, you know, all refractive uh, cases. Press, by, press beyond is his forte, and his uh, outcomes are wonderful. But uh, he's going to cover a very soft uh, talk today. Yes, and sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> go thank through the soft cataract. And uh, we know that it's more difficult than a hard cataract sometimes. Yes, sir. The softer way. Yes. Yeah, thank you, TTL, sir, my guru. And uh, I'm also so glad that to come Delhi regularly next week also. We are coming to be part of SIRS conference at RPC Alumni Meet. So soft cataract make you give your life hard. This is my talk today. So, why it's hard? Because, see, understanding the difficulty, most of us, when you're operating soft care tract, they'll have a overconfidence. Because while doing the rexis, 
there might be a cost tech disturbance. Sometimes you may land up in doing an incomplete hydro procedure that may lead into difficult in rotation of the nucleus. Of course, difficulty in cracking or chopping, it may lead into something called cheese wiring. Quick aspiration, sometimes you may have a PC tear. And when you, all these soft cataract in younger patient, normally they'll have a softer globe and anti-chamber distance and collapse easily. So coming to the pre-op examination is very important. Look for the grade of cataract. If the soft, then always note for how much is the maximum pupillary dilatation. Look for, you have to do a proper biometry and look for endothelial count. Very, very important. All my cataract patients, we do specular microscopy. So coming to the step-by-step -step procedure, wound construction is similar to the any of the fake emulsification. Since it's a soft, immature cataract, capsule staining may or may not be necessary. Coming to the capsular axis, I think my friend Satyajit Sena might have explained, which is going to the perfect axis. For like an uh, experienced surgeon like Professor Tithyal, he'll do how much is the, uh, normally he go ahead with the smaller rexis or medium rexis. But beginners, I personally feel that to start with for soft cataract, large rexis is ideal. Normally, younger patient will have a more elastic capsule. You better to do rexis with the forceps. Then uh, always in the initial, why you have to do a bigger rexis? Because you can prolapse the nucleus in out of the bag also. And also, you will have a easy to remove the epinucleus and also cortical clearance. Coming to the hydro procedure, hydro dissection is very important. It uh, allows easy rotation of the nucleus. You can try and prolapse the one pole into the entry chamber depending upon the surgeon preference. Only initially I want to tell you. Hydro delineation is very important that will add in removal of the nucleus with epinucleus support, but very important, you have to always keep the low phaco energy. See, this is a, a video I'm just showing you how we ha you have to do the hydro dissection. Go with the 26 gauge ne needle. Don't flush sudden. Do a slow, gentle hydro. Then you'll have this golden ring. Once you have a golden ring, I think uh, you can, uh, the softer cataract, even if the excess is bigger, you can flip the nucleus into the EAC. This is one more video I'm just showing you about the only hydro dissection, very much immature cataract you can see. The rexis is quite big here. So when you're doing also, you have to be very careful. Sometimes uh, you never know the zonal status also. You may land in with the damaging the zonules. So coming to the fake emulsification, multiple methods are uh, available. But what point remember is you have to train your trench should be deep and long. Try to crack only at the center. Rather make into two halves, rather doing a multiple pieces whenever tackling the soft cataract. Do not go to the extreme periphery because sometimes you may have a chances of PC rent. The key is low vacuum and high flow rate. So coming to the direct shop, these are the setting, normally high flow rate, low vacuum. Always use very minimum or no power. Prefer to do with the blunt chopper. My preferred technique is going to be the horizontal chopping technique. This is how you do the horizontal chop. After you do the hydro dissection, hydro delineation, and you divide. So just to show you one more video, this is a just a inverted video, you can able to see Go straight, come with on. This is called horizontal chop. So most preferred in soft cataract, in your harder cataract, I would prefer to do a vertical chop. This is how you chop it. It's almost like grade two cataract. This is very, very important. Yeah. So there are other techniques, something called flip and chop. That means salute the one pole of the uh, nucleus into the entry chamber either while doing the hydro procedure or mechanically can do it, or you can flip also can be done while doing the fake emulsification. But it is very safe for PC, but it is not so safe for endothelium. You have to always f uh, keep putting the uh, entry chamber with both the dispersive and coercive elastic.
So this is how, this is a few videos I'm just showing you. That is a hydro and flip while doing the hydro only. The one pole has been come out as I said that. This all can be done whenever you are doing a larger axis. When you are doing the softer cataract in your beginning of your career. Because as sir said that if you plan for all premium lens then this larger rexis is not going to help you. You have to do an adequate rexis of around 5 to 5.5 mm. This is very very important. So other video you could be able to see. Uh, see while doing the hydro itself once again these all cases in the beginning for beginners I am showing you this. How with the help of cannula only I nudge the nucleus into the entry chamber. Then with the help of a blunt chopper you can chop the nucleus and do it. This is one more video I am just showing you here down here. Uh, after doing the hydro dissection some of our friends they try to do something called mechanical flip that is flipping the nucleus into the entry chamber mechanically. There is some bit of a risk involved in this you may tend to damage the piece in this case once again depending upon the surgeon's confidence. Then there is a one more very famous technique called a roulette technique. Here of course large rexis is required. You need to have a good hydro to rotate. Normally it will be done with the help of 20 degree trip, high flow rate, moderate vacuum. Always stay closer to the equator and carousel the nucleus into the entry chamber. So there are different type of chopping technique is described by a lot of, doc lot of our friends, stop and chop, pre-chop chip and flip but direct horizontal chop and flip and chop works in most of these soft cataracts. Coming to the epinucleus and cortex removal is also very very important. A good hydro dissection will prevent the epinucleus from being the hazel out. Inside out hydro can be done. So cortex to be cleared like any other case how you do the cataract surgery. So in softer cataract always leave behind the cortex till the end of your surgery. So in conclusion, soft cataract can prove to be a tough nut to crack. Endocapsular manipulations could sometimes be unnecessary advantage, uh, advantage. With the refractive lens exchange gaining more popularity nowadays, we'll be seeing a lot more of them when you are with this soft cataract. High flow rate, low vacuum and power is the take home message. I thank uh, Dr. Santush Shanovar and the entire and also Rolika call me all the way from Karnataka UDP and also I run a PG training both for SICS, FACO and also refractive under the Health University of Government of Karnataka. Thank you one and all. Thank you Dr. Kudlu uh, for highlighting the you know basic techniques of managing soft cataracts and uh, we, as we said in the beginnings all types of cataract can be difficult. Uh, right from the you know, way of examination wise. Sometimes you s examine the patient, you realize this case will be difficult. And you think this case it will be a cake, cake walk, you know, it will be, it looks like very simple. But difficulty can be, you know, there when you start the surgery, right? From the incision onwards to uh, actual completion of surgery till the patient comes out for the operation theater. And soft cataract is the one where uh, you know, everything looks very simple to begin with when you examine my eyes, yeah, oh, soft cataract, I can do very nicely. But there you need to check your parameters appropriately. Your doctor could do nicely told, low parameters, low FACO, depending on the grade of nucleus, it will make a lot of difference. And he highlighted one point which is very, very important, a nice size rexis. And the good hydro procedure is the key to success in the soft cataracts. Very nicely highlighted there. If you have a good delineation, which is important here, because in soft cataract you, are, you have a very high chance for a going through and through with your phaco probe. So if you have an epicortical cushion, that will safeguard the you know damage to the posterior capsule. So try to have an endonuclear separation from an epicortical cushion, and epinuclear cushion will safeguard the emulsification. Endonuclear can be managed by various ways. You can do a sculpt and chip and flip techniques or rotational techniques, or you can crack also, you can chop also, depending on little softness or hardness. So very important, all of you young generation, always try to create the apicortical cushion for yourself, and that will safeguard the posterior capsule. If you don't try to eat the apicortical cushion beforehand, do a multi uh, separation, a multi chop, try to save the apicortis till the end. Thank you, Dr. Kudli, for you, a sir. nice uh, 
beginning. Thank you, sir. One thing I'd like to highlight in the beginning, when we are talking about a case uh, uh, examination history-wise, if the young person comes to you for surgery, like Dr. Kudlu was saying, you know, he would have done a presbyopic surgery for those patients. Sometimes the lady don't tell you that they have undergone refractive procedure. And do a routine calculation and you have hyperopic next day. And patient cry. So always ask the history of refractive surgery for your patient. In your generation, out of 90 per people, 50% would have undergone refractive surgery by the time you do cataract surgery. One line should be there, are, have you undergone procedure like refractive surgery, laser refractive surgery. Okay? Yeah. Especially if you have a flatter case, something like around 40 or something, then you should suspect. Do a topography that will immediately tell you. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. We would now uh, like to invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ragini, Professor Ragini Parikh, Madam. She is a brilliant surgeon, distinguished ophthalmic surgeon at uh, JJ Group of Hospitals. She is the professor and head of department and holds a world record for conducting the highest volume of eye surgeries. She is an excellent speaker and she has conducted numerous camps all over Maharashtra and she is the role model for all of us. So introducing to you all uh, Dr. Ragini Parikh, Madam, and she'll speak to us on cortical aspiration and IOL implantation techniques. Thank you so much, Annaga. So I think Annaga uh, has been my friend since we were doing PG. So she's very fond of me. And I think uh, that the role model for all of us and the teacher of teachers is sitting right here on the dais, Padma Shri, uh, Dr. Tityal, sir. Uh, he looks young, but uh, I've known him from the time that I was doing my PG and you know, my teacher, Padmasri, Dr. Lahane sir, uh, our mentor, uh, Dr. Marathe sir, uh, KP, all the students here. And uh, I'm glad to say that uh, so my final year students have been attending this course and uh, they are here and they've been... Uh, so a few of them are sitting here who assist us uh, for 18 hours and now they are doing cataract surgeries and surgeries too. So I'm really glad uh, that they are attending this course. So my topic is cataract uh, cortex aspiration. Uh, we've been seeing, uh, all of you are now doing cataract surgeries. And whatever type of surgery it is, phaco emulsification, OSS, or ECC, cortex aspiration remains an important part of the surgery. So when my PGs are learning, they say, ma'am, you know, where we get stuck is cortex aspiration. We get scared because we are worried uh, that everything is now out and uh, we are scared of the PC tear. Cortex and, uh, aspiration is very, very important because, you know, you see in the past when people did not have very good microscopes and all, we used to see people with a lot of... Uh, cortex or PCO, a complete cortex uh, removal helps prevent PCO because now cataract is a catarefractive surgery. The patient has expectations of very good vision and not only for a short time but for the longest amount of time. So it's very important that you do a complete cortex removal because if it is, and you know, we are not doing mature cataracts now. We are doing cataracts much earlier uh, so there is a large amount of cortex epinucleus and which has to be managed. If cortex is not completely removed, definitely it will not cause posterior capsular opacification, but it will promote or it will help and it will make it worse. Uh, there may be a reaction and there may be anterior segment uh, inflammation. If the IOL is not in the back, the fibrosis which takes place may cause push and pull of the lens and decentration of the lens, which is not what you want. Uh, so, how do you aspirate the cortex? So, you know there are different steps in cataract surgery after the removal of the nucleus, which may be either by phaco emulsification or manual small incision cataract surgery. What you are left with is uh, pieces of cortex. Cortex is also a part of the lens. The lens which gets compacted uh, becomes a nucleus. And the fibers which are laid down last are the, uh, uh, the fibers that you see are the cortical material. So there are various ways that you can remove it. All of you are familiar with it. One is the Simcoe cannula. One is the single port aspiration and the AC maintainer. I think we have used it uh, uh, so often and so much that we have popularized this and so much so that one of the companies also called the, uh, the single port aspiration cannula as the Lani's cannula. The, the bimanual irrigation aspiration where these two ports 
are attached to the FECO machine and uh, the coaxial aspiration. So these are the various ways in which the cortex is removed after the nucleus delivery. So what is the basic technique, okay? In whatever technique that you are using, you have to engage the cortex, you have to separate it or strip it from the capsule and then you finally aspirate it. So that's how it is managed. So what is to be done in engaging the cortex? So when you see, and it is very easy to do it if you have a good rexis. So all the steps of cataract surgery, they follow one another. If you have uh, missed a step or if one of the steps is not complete, like say for example, you don't have a good rexis, then it makes cortex difficult because there may be capsular flaps which get engaged. So if you have a good capsular rexis, then you you, it's com comparatively easier. But if you have flaps, then it becomes difficult and you have to be extra careful. If your flap is stained with uh, dye, then it is easier because you can separate the flap from the cortex, but you have to be careful. So what you have to do in engaging the cortex is that the tip or the aspirating port or the opening has to be anterior. If it is posterior, then you will uh, suck on the posterior capsule. And uh, you, have, you should not, you should aspirate only what you see. Because if you're going under the iris and if you do not know what you are aspirating, for that a fully dilated pupil is a must. If the pupil does not dilate, nowadays you have phenocane uh, which dilates the pupil. So you catch only what you see. Because if you do not see what you are catching, you will catch the PC or something, or the iris or something that you don't want. And the port has to be anterior. So it is good that you do not go into the periphery. Now, once you hold something, you have to pull it or you have to separate it from the capsule. So what you have to do is you have to tease it. You tease it and you sometimes, you know, if you pull too vigorously, you may cause zonular dialysis. We will be seeing these in the videos, but I'm just talking a little bit of theory. And again, don't aspirate in the periphery. Bring it into the center. Bring it into the area which is visible to you and then do it. The last part is the aspiration. Once you know and once you have correctly judged what you are holding, which is not the capsule and only the cortex, and then you can aspirate so that it gets sucked. So that's very, very important. These are the three parts. When you are actually doing it, these three parts merge into one, but uh, when you are slowly, slowly doing and when you are learning, you can tell yourself this. And later on, it is like phaco emulsification. You don't have to tell your mind it is one, two, three. It automatically happens. So we will see this cortex aspiration video. So as you can see, this is the AC maintainer. This is the, uh, can we have the lights off? And so if you can see, this is the peripheral cortex, which is there and which we are aspirating. So now slow. This is the step one. You can see the cortex, you can see the opening in the cannula and you are engaging it. So that was the step one. Step two is to tease it and to gently bring it into the center. Step three is now whatever you are seeing and holding, you aspirate it so that it gets aspirated into the cannula. So we will see this together. Okay, so hold, hold or engage or grab in the tip, pull, pull, that is teasing. This becomes very easy if you have a proper hydrodelineation, a proper capsulorexis. Each step follows the other, so you have to perfect the steps of capsulorexis, hydrodissection, so this cortex becomes loose. Now the sub-incisional cortex, what is under the incision is most difficult, but the advantage of having multiple ports is that these ports can be interchanged. So if you, so the 12 o'clock cortex or where you are sitting can be removed from the side port. That is the beauty of having multiple ports. So as you can see, this is the last piece which is aspirated, right? So, and now this is the polishing of the posterior capsule. Now the, it is very, uh, with the AC maintainer, it's very easy. Now as you can see over here, again, removal of the cortex engage, engage, pull, pull slightly or tease and aspirate. Now this is very easy 
if you have a capsulorexis. This can also be done if you don't have a capsulorexis. So now you are changing the port as you see. So you use the side port, now you can use the main incision. Now here you can see there is a folding of the capsule. If you hold the capsule, this is the posterior polishing. See, polishing takes a little bit of uh, expertise. So if you see while polishing, if there are holes in the capsule, as you can see over there, that see, you can see the crinkling. It's very, very visible. That means you are holding the PC. It appears like a fibers web or folds. That means you are catching the PC. What you have to do is release it immediately. If you try to pull it, there will be a PC tear. Now, when you are doing uh, polishing of the posterior capsule, should be done only if the patient is not moving if the eye is soft, if the posterior capsule is concave, if the posterior capsule is convex, then you will cause a PC tear. And while doing a PC polishing, you cannot have the cannula vertical. If this is the PC, it should be like this. This is a movement so that if this is like this, it will aspirate, pluck the PC and tear it. If it is flat, so the undersurface of the cannula helps to uh, polish or actually scrape slightly the fibers of the posterior capsule, they are released and then they can be aspirated. It uh, takes a little bit of effort and uh, energy and you know a learning curve is there to learn PC polishing and the same cannula can be used to clean the undersurface of the anterior capsule. If you are polishing the undersurface of the posterior anterior capsule, it will be helpful in preventing posterior capsular opacification. So what are the advantages of the Simcoe cannula? I think from the time that we learned uh, irrigation aspiration or extracapsular cataract surgery in our undergraduate, we've been reading and learning about the Simcoe cannula. We all know that the Simcoe cannula is, has irrigation and aspiration both. It is a single instrument. It has a double port, one irrigation and one aspiration. It's very easy to learn how to use it. And there is a constant flow, okay? Uh, only thing is that you have to use the main port. One thing you must learn is that you must use correct instrumentation. Like the side port should be made uh, small. It should not be a large side port so that you can put the Simco inside, no. If you want to use a Simco, it should be used through the main port. If you want to use the side port, the instrument should be as small as the side port, which should not be more than 1.1 millimeter. Because the safety and the aseptic precautions are very, very important. If your ports are bigger, it will compromise the safety of the incision with regards to infection and endophthalmitis. So it's very important to be scientific. The main port in phaco emulsification should be only between 2.2 to 2.8 or 3. In SICS, it should be 5 or 5.5. The side ports should be made using an MVR blade, and it should not be more than 1.1. So knowing the incisions, making them correctly, and in using the instruments correctly is very, very important. So Simco should not be used through the side port because it has two channels, the irrigation and the aspiration. So it is thicker, and it will lead a larger port, which uh, you are going to close only by hydration. So that's very important. Single port aspiration, as you've been seeing in the video, will be uh, the AC maintainer, which is the third hand of the surgeon. As the name suggests, it is self-maintaining. It does not, it, it has a screw. So once you put it into the side port, it maintains itself. There is continuous irrigation. It keeps the anterior chamber formed. And uh, so the PC is concave and not convex. The AC does not shallow. And uh, it can be used, as you saw, for PC polishing. And it needs a much smaller port. That is also what you saw. Of course, it is manual. Bimanual aspiration is machine dependent. So after doing phaco emulsification, you remove the phaco emulsification probe and you put one as the aspiration and one as the irrigation. You have to you hold both and you can use them. It is machine dependent and uh, it can be interchanged. So if you interchange the hands, it's very good because it helps in 360 degree cleanup of the cortex, which is very, very important.
And only thing is that you need very good food control uh, because uh, you have to learn the food control when you are learning phaco emulsification. So if you are not learning phaco emulsification and if you are learning only SICS, the manual uh, AC maintainer and the uh, single port aspiration cannula is very easy to learn. Once you learn cortex aspiration with that, when you learn phaco emulsification, you can switch over to the bimanual irrigation aspiration. So it is extremely, the coaxial is extremely efficient with uh, vacuum generated. It is more, uh, the vacuum is much more than the manual method. It is a single instrument and it has a double port serving irrigation and aspiration. Of course, again, it is machine uh, dependent and you have to have complete foot control and uh, it may be difficult to remove the sub incisional cortex. Good morning, uh, Mahipal sir. Thank you so much for the opportunity, uh, sir, with Santosh. And thank you for the opportunity given to all our PG students too. So in summary, cortex aspiration should be thorough. Leaving lens epithelial sense behind is an invitation to after cataract or posterior capsular opacification. The best thing is that you should see a lot of techniques. You have so many teachers. This time you have learned so many techniques. You can improvise on any technique, do the technique that suits you, but keeping in mind the patient's welfare. The patient always stands at the center of whatever we do, the patient's welfare. It's not necessary to say that I do only this technique and I know only this technique. The most important is start learning from the basics and then go to the advanced and keeping in mind every step, even though you are a beginner, to leave or give over the case when you cannot manage because the patient needs to see. Your learning is going to be there all your life. Uh, changing irrigation and aspiration ports helps in removal of sub-incisional cortex, which used to be always difficult. The second part of my talk is IOL implantation techniques. Uh, morning, Ramamurti sir, Harshul. Morning, sir. So as we all know, the first lens was implanted by Sir Harold Ridley and uh, Dr. Kelman invented phaco emulsification. Two minutes, okay. So, uh, so this is the development of the intraocular lens, uh, many generations. IOL calculation formulas also changed. These are the evolution in lens designs. Uh, so these are, so there are various ways to deliver the IOL. It can be wound assisted or it can be in, inside the wound or directly inside the bag. So these are the cartridges which are developed to deliver the intraocular lenses. So if you are going to load a lens, it's going to take time to load the lens and then put in the lens. And uh, there will be risk of infection, damage to the intraocular lens and all that. Preloaded IOLs are easier, they're time saving and uh, you are not it's like a non-touch technique, which is very, very important. So as you can see over here, this is a pre-loaded lens. There is an AC maintainer, and it is injecting directly into the anterior chamber. Now with phaco emulsification, you want uh, it to be done through a small port. That is why you use these injectors and cartridge where the foldable lens goes inside, and then it is dialed into the bag. So you have to use these pre-loaded systems or the injectors and cartridges. And then you remove the viscoelastic and center the IOL inside the bag. This is the technique where in manual SICS, you are putting a rigid three please lens. So you put the lower loop inside the bag and you dial the lens engaging the dialer in the superior hole, dipping it down and then rotating clockwise so that it dials inside the bag. So these are the main techniques which are used today for a rigid lens. And you have to know the technique which is correct, holding the lens, putting it inside the bag. So important aspects is that the anterior chamber should be formed. Use of viscoelastics because if the IOL touches the endothelium, it will de-roof the endothelium. The substance of any IOL damages the endothelial cell and wherever it touches, it will de-roof. Once it gets de-roofed, it is damaged forever and you know that they are never reproduced. So you have to use viscoelastic and protect. The IOL while putting in should never, never, never touch the corneal endothelium. So it should be slow and steady. The anterior chamber should be formed and you must remove the viscoelastic. Uh, IOLs should be put inside the bag for the best 
uh, safety and the best results. And for that, the CC is important. Thank you, Mahipal sir, once again for the opportunity. Sorry, Anagha. I thought that I had 15 minutes. That is why. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. All the best to you. And on behalf of all of you, we must thank Mahipal sir and Santosh and Rolika for such a wonderful organization and uh, the wonderful teaching program that is there for all of you. No, no, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was an excellent presentation. You covered all the uh, important points and I think definitely all the students are going to benefit from all the pearls of wisdom that they are getting from the most experienced of surgeons uh, that are present here. So uh, this was regarding how the cortical aspiration and different steps of phaco emulsification surgery so that the end of it you want to give the patient a perfect visual outcome. So you have now learned about the different kinds of steps and the uh, different kinds of lenses and how you're going to implant them. I would like to now invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Ramurthy, sir. He is a world-renowned ophthalmologist and the chairman of the Eye Foundation Group of Eye Hospitals, an excellent surgeon with great experience. And he is going to speak to us on astigmatism control in cataract surgery. Thank you. Uh, can I request Dr. Maipal Sachdi, sir, to please join at the dais, sir, as chair? Thank you, sir. That's one way of ensuring Maipal stays in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Anaga, and uh, hearty congratulations to Maipal, Santosh, Rolika, and that uh, wonderful team, not just for this uh, conference but the year-long webinars that they conduct, eye focus has truly become the icon as far as ophthalmic education in India is concerned. And I'm sure the only direction they can go from here is upwards. All the very best to you for the future days. Uh, the topic given to me in this session is astigmatic control in cataract surgery. And let me try to make it as simple as possible. I am sure most of you have come across this slide where it says that more than 20 to 25% of our patients have a keratometric astigmatism, anterior corneal astigmatism of more than 1.5 diopters. And about 10% of our patients have more than, more than two diopters. And obviously, if you leave this uncorrected at the end of your surgery, whether it's a monofocal and more importantly, with multifocal intraocular implants, it's going to impair the unaided visual acuity as well as, well as the image quality in these patients. It's just a graphic representation of what exactly happens. Just a 0.5 diopters of cylinder uncorrected, you can see the deterioration in the, uh, uh, sorry, the, can I have a pointer? Uh, show the deterioration in the quality of vision. And when it's one diopter is uncorrected, you can see the more significant impact that it has. So obviously this is not the kind of vision that you youngsters want to leave behind your patients as ophthalmologists of the third millennium and we owe it to them to address this in a significant manner. And what are the options available to you? Actually, this is listed in the reverse order of importance as the frequency with which you use, toric intraocular lenses, laser accurate keratotomies, limbal relaxing incision, opposite clear corner incision, and an incision on steep axis. For a long time, I used to believe that the 2.4 millimeter temporal clear corneal incision that, that I create has creates an astigmatism of 0.44 diopters and usually used to do an on-axis uh, uh, incision, thinking that it will address about 0.5 diopters of astigmatism. But seminal work from the likes of Doc Cock and uh, Graham Barrett has shown that astigmatism not only has a magnitude, but also has a direction. And because of this, they tend to neutralize each other over the corneal surface because of which for a sub 2.4 millimeter temporal clear corneal incision, the astigmatic impact is just about 0.1 diopter. And that's exactly the reason now almost most modern surgeons have given up in their phaco emulsification, have given up the concept of doing on axis, on the steeper axis incisions. If you're doing a 2.8 millimeter incision, it might uh, compensate up to a degree extent of about 0.2 to 0.25 diopters. Of course, if you do a large clerocornial incision for a SAC's incision superiorly, that's a different story. And some of our uh, colleagues have used that to address astigmatism with SACS. 
But as regards fake emulsification, the concept of doing on axis, steep axis incisions is given up. Similarly, the concept of doing opposite clear corneal incisions, as you can see here, it's a very old video of mine because I've given this up more than a decade back, where you make your primary incision at the end of the surgery at, uh, at exactly 180 degrees, you just uh, pass the, make a uh, different incision. And since no instrument is passing through it, no distortion is happening, the impact of this incision is even less than your primary incision. So again, this is something the surgeon does more for his good feeling rather than for any real benefit as far as the patient is concerned. So when you talk about addressing astigmatism in a serious manner, neither doing an on-axis uh, incision nor an opposite clear corneal incision is something which gives you any kind of reliable advantage. Now coming to these limber relaxing incisions, this is a reasonably old video of mine and you can see that uh, this works and uh, you can, uh, the axis marchings is being done and uh, there are several nomograms that like the Nickman nomogram, the Donenfield nomogram, which tells you the arc length of each incision that needs to be made. And up to about 0 0.75, 0 0.1 diopter of astigmatism, you can deal with this. The only problem is it is something like radial keratotomy. It works and it depends upon the corneal hysteresis, how, long, how much benefit it gives and whether the benefit is going to stay with the patient is something that's unpredictable. Once we got digital imaging systems like this, the uh, Baryon or the Callisto, then again, my interest in this came up because now the incisions that we are making is more precise. You can see that I'm able to, if I say 30 degrees, it's exactly 30 degrees. And the diamond knife that I'm using is an unguarded diamond knife of 600 microns, which precisely makes the incision there. Up to about, especially when I'm doing a multifocal intraocular lens, and then there is a uh, against the rule or with the rule astigmatism, along with the incision, I go ahead and use these paired incisions, and that does uh, reduce the amount of postoperative astigmatism, though it's not refractive accuracy that we are aiming at. This is what you see on the first postoperative day, little bit of corneal edema, the incisions are still there, and this is the limbal relaxing incision. And you have fine-tuned this with the laser arcuate keratotomies. Basically, the principles remain the same, only thing is you have moved it forward in the sense that it is done at a dimension of about eight millimeters. And then subsequently, you have to invariably open up these incisions. Basically, they talk about intrastromal incisions, but that hardly has any impact. So this is on the table. Even if I'm doing a, a dealing with against the rule astigmatism and I have a temporal clear corneal incision, I go ahead and use these uh, uh, arcuate keratotomies using the laser, and that's the end of the surgery. You can see a multifocal implant that has been there, and you open up these incisions. Again, up to about 0.75 diopters, it does deal, uh, give you reasonable results. So these are the adjuncts that we have uh, as far as uh, addressing astigmatism is concerned in cataract surgery. And this is why is the laser arcuate keratotomy were a little more favorable towards that? because it's image guided, it's precise and uniform, the exact length of the incision, the depth of the incision, 80%, 90%, etc., is very precisely under, under control. You can titrate it also. You can even leave the incisions unopened. A uh, week later, you can uh, look at the amount of astigmatism the patient is left behind with, and you can open up these incisions. This, there was talked about, frankly, I have not done it even a single time. Whenever I do an arcuate keratotomy, I open it right up on the table. But uh, suffice it to say, these, uh, whatever I have mentioned so far, are measures to debulk the amount of astigmatism that you leave behind post-operatively, but this is not going to give you precise results. So what is the tool that we have as far as dealing with astigmatism precisely is concerned? It's essentially toric intraocular lenses. And as you can see over here, the toric intraocular lenses does not work too well. If there's a, a corneal scar, if there's a post-radial keratotomy, cornea is very irregular, if there's keratoconus, it works precisely whenever it's an orthogonal astigmatism, that is the steep and the flat axis are exactly at 90 degrees to each other. Having said that, there are quite a few cases of keratoconus 
uh, hydrogen keratectasia, where after stabilizing the cone, because of cor corneal collagen cross-linking or because of aging, if the cone is reasonably centered and the best corrected visual acuity of the patient is reasonably good with glasses, we have gone ahead and implanted toric and troc lenses. But for the purpose of examination, for the purpose of uh, understanding, the toric and troc lenses work well, best, when the astigmatism is regular and the steep axis and the flat axis are at 90 degrees to each other. One of the most important things that you need to remember is that do not go be guided by the astigmatism that is there in the patient's glasses. What you are dealing with is a keratometric astigmatism because there could be a significant element of lenticular astigmatism which is compromising the keratometric astigmatism. This is just a case in point as you can see over here. Uh, unfortunately, uh, as you can see uh, over here, the, what you see on the right hand top corner is uh, from the internal optics. What you see below that is a cornea and uh, what you see on the left hand top panel is basically the total astigmatism that is there. Almost the entire astigmatism in this case is from the lens and the cornea is quite pristine. You can see hardly any astigmatism there. So when you do a cataract surgery and this lens comes out, a patient who was having minus 1.5 diopters of a cylinder almost throughout his life, once the lens comes out, there is no need for a uh, toric intraocular lens. On the other hand, look at this case where the astigmatism of the internal optics and the cornea is almost completely neutralized because of which the patient has not been having any cylinder in the glasses. But once the lens comes out, the corneal astigmatism and this is a case which should require a toric and troc lens. So do not go by the uh, refraction, but go by the keratometry, especially the anterior keratometry. In the last about six to seven years, there has been a sea change as far as adaptation of toric and troc lenses, as well as our understanding of these lenses is concerned. It's not just because of the advances in the intraocular lens technology, but certain basic aspects like posterior corneal astigmatism, surgically induced astigmatism, toricity ratio, etc. Let me deal with it very um, briefly. As far as posterior toricity is concerned, posterior cornea is something we do not see, we do not measure, we do not understand. But then today we understand that the posterior corneal astigmatism in almost 85% of the cases is against the rule astigmatism. And whenever the cornea has with the rule astigmatism on the surface, it sort of neutralizes it to some extent. But if it is against the rule of astigmatism on the corneal surface, then it enhances it by about 0.3 diopters to 0.5 diopters. It's somewhat counterintuitive because you think that you are making your incision temporarily. This is going to counteract whatever against the rule of astigmatism is there. But this posterior corneal astigmatism actually enhances the anterior corneal astigmatism while it neutralizes with the rule astigmatism on the anterior surface of the uh, cornea. And this posterior corneal astigmatism, unlike anterior corneal astigmatism, does not change over the lifetime of the patient. So there is, a, as far as the anterior corneal astigmatism is concerned, there's another point that you need to understand that the anterior corneal astigmatism shifts by about 3 eighths of a diopter for every decade of the lifetime of the patient. That is the reason most of our refractive surgery patients present to us with, with the rule astigmatism, while most of our cataract patients present to us with against the rule astigmatism. So this is again something that you need to factor in. And sometimes when you see patients in their 30s and 40s with oblique astigmatism, that's because essentially the astigmatism is shifting from with the rule to against the rule. That's one of the reasons that when you, uh, yeah, young patients present to you with, with the rule astigmatism, you're putting in a, a toric ICL or a toric IOL, you have to factor in the uh, concept that this astigma with the rule astigmatism is going to diminish over the lifetime of the patient. But if the patient has against the rule astigmatism, it's a 20 year old with a pediatric or a, with a zonular cataract, you are dealing with them. That is something you definitely need to address because this is going to further increase with the, during the lifetime of the patient. And again, this uh, concept of toricity ratio, where we think that for every 1.5 diopters at the uh, lenticular surface, about one diopter at the cornea is neutralized. 
but whenever you go ahead with highly hypropic eyes or highly myopic eyes, you can see this is a hypropic eye of about uh, 20, 20 millimeters of length with 30, very flat cornea. You just require about 1.29 diopters to correct one diopter on the cornea. But on the other hand, when it is a very long eye, myopic eye with a steep cornea, you require almost 1.86 diopters. The concept that every four one and a half diopters, one diopter of astigmatism gets corrected on the cornea is erroneous when you come to the extremes of power. This is something that we already dealt with. So what we are talking about, the centroid value of the surgically induced astigmatism, which for a temporal clear cornea is just about 0.1 diopter. And as far as the formula itself is concerned, there are multiple formulae that are available today. But suffice it to say, this is our go-to formula. I, time does not permit me to deal with all of them. But the go-to formula for us is not the Barrett Universal 2, but the Barrett Toric Calculator. As soon as the patient is identified to have a cataract, we put this patient on this. And if we find that the toric lens that's uh, needed, then the entire counseling for the patient is towards going in for a toric monofocal or a toric multifocal. This is the entire suit of formula that's available, and this addresses almost your entire uh, biometry needs. And where exactly it's available, many of the current uh, optical biometers come loaded with this. Just in case you do not have access to that, you still have it in the ACRS, APACRS websites. Just on the home page, you can do, uh, you, if you click on this IOL formula, all these drop down. Actually, the Barrett RX formula, Barrett True K, is not available in any optical biometer, but it's available only in this um, uh, ACRS and APACRS websites. Even if you do an immersion A scan, do a, a keratometry, auto K, you can still benefit from these formula. This is just to show you what exactly we do. You can see the axial length of 23.5, the IOL power of uh, 20. All this is uh, AC depth of 3.65 because remember there is a toricity ratio. The amount of astigmatism that we are going to uh, correct will depend upon the basic spherical power, the intraocular lens that we are implanting. Again, the surgically induced astigmatism is just 0 0.1, not 0 0.3 or 0.4. And uh, you also have the benefit of uh, in, uh, putting in the exact K value depending upon the instrument that you are using. So why exactly do we prefer the Barrett uh, toric calculator? Is because it takes into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism, the effect of the shift of the uh, toricity during the aging of the patient, targets about 0.25 diopters of with the rule astigmatism, takes into consideration the axial length and the IOL spherical power. That's the concept of toricity ratio. The centroid value of the ast induced astigmatism of 0.1 is something that you can feed in. And the K index is again, as you saw, can be, uh, can be varied depending upon the essen essentially the instrument that you're using. These are the multiple modalities but by which you can mark the cornea. Most of the work, if you have, of course, access to a digital marker, that would be a great way to go. But this is always, it's not necessary that you need that before in, uh, taking on toric and toric lenses. You can see this is the preoperative marking that was made at uh, 0, 180, and 90 degrees axis. This is basically the Mendel's marking ring and the orientation of the patient. And basically, it's just a 2.4 millimeter temporal clear corneal incision that's being made. And that's the after phaco emulsification. Can take about two, three minutes. Uh, that's the intraocular lens that going inside. And uh, it's important that uh, uh, the lens opens up in a very controlled manner. And subsequently, you rotate the lens in the clockwise direction so as to orient it along the markings that are there, which you had earlier made. Whenever you're using viscoelastic, then it's extremely important that you evacuate the viscoelastic quite completely from behind the lens, because otherwise, if you leave behind some viscoelastic, there is a tendency for the lens to rotate in the post-operative period. And uh, that's complete evacuation of the viscoelastic that's being done and then subsequent centration of the lens. Today, of course, we have the uh, benefits of this, uh, doing the toric intraocular lens implantation under uh, uh, digital guidance. In this case, there's no preoperative or intraoperative marking that's necessary. Basically, there is already these incisions, of, um, the location of this is compensated for the, um, as for the specific uh, astigmatism that is there in this particular patient and uh, the cyclotorsion that is there, the incisions are made temporarily. 
and then uh, intraocular lens implant is not very different. Let me skip these slides, but uh, just go on directly to the take-home messages that I want to leave you behind with. So tips to maximize outcomes, multiple measurements of K reading, consider but not be guided by the refractive cylinder, check the ocular surface, not just before the surgery, but even before your biometry, enter the measurements immediately because sometimes exact astigmatism, axis, et cetera, they can be error. Remember the surgically induced astigmatism, the centroid value is just 0.1, undercorrect with the rule astigmatism, overcorrect against the rule astigmatism, and on the table, a little longer incision because you want a very stable anterior chamber. Actually, I patch my toric and toric lenses patients for a, a one hour post-surgery, see them post-operatively downstairs in the slit lamp and send them. I believe that uh, most of the rotation of these lenses happen in the first one hour and patching them uh, to some extent obvious this. Avoid over-inflating, even whether it's viscoelastic, whether it's uh, saline behind the lens, there's a tendency for the lens to rotate. Nudge the intraocular lens onto the posterior capsule so that it's well seated on that. Make a slightly smaller rexus so that there is a very regular uniform overlap of the rexus margin onto the optics of the lens. Ensure that the position of the lens is still quite intact once the speculum is off because there's a certain amount of flow of fluid in the last step and that could sometimes cause a little bit of rotation. If there is a residual rotation, go ahead and rotate these lenses if the rotation is necessary using the astigmatismfix.com uh, Barrett RX formula about two weeks later. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir. That was a very, very excellent presentation. And I think definitely all of the students would definitely know how to go about controlling astigmatism and we'll look at it with a different perspective whenever they see a patient and then we'll decide what is the best course of action for your patient. So, uh, Ram, uh, you, if you were to say, I think uh, obviously you feel that uh, it's going to be a lens-based procedure that's going to be the best way to tackle astigmatism, right? True. When you're doing a cataract surgery, yes, uh, lens-based yeah. procedure would be the best way to tackle it. And uh, though you didn't mention, but uh, uh, I just want to uh, say to the residents and everybody that in case there's a post-op residual refractive error, uh, which includes astigmatism, there are multiple ways to solve them. One would be a piggyback lens, but then we are underutilizing uh, uh, an enhancement procedure by a refractive surgery on top of the cornea. So if you have something that is residual, you can work on that uh, uh, if you don't want to re-enter the eye for taking care of the refractive error. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. I'd like now to invite uh, Professor Mahipal Sajdev, sir for his talk. He is the Chairman Managing Director of the Center for Sight Group of Eye Hospitals and we are very fortunate that he has brought such a wonderful platform for all of us. It's a great amount of learning year on year persistently and it's not just uh, he's great in uh, his growing his hospitals but it's basically the academics and the kind of learning that he is imparting through this platform I think uh, kudos and hats off to you and your team, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anaga, for the praise, but I think uh, it's the team CFS uh, that uh, really works tirelessly uh, for this particular program led by Santosh. Uh, pleasure to have all of you here, and uh, I'll be talking about advances, and that's something that's uh, always been close to our heart in CFS. So I'm talking about uh, three particular advances, though there are several advances that are happening in cataract surgery, and as you uh, understand cataract surgery is today uh, the most commonly performed surgery on any part of the body. So these are three things that I'll be talking about and I have no financial disclosure. So this is the first, I think, introduction for you on in this course on to femtosecond. So can anybody say as to what is a femtosecond? What does it stand for? This could come as an MCQ, yeah? So it is, uh, it is actually a measurement of time and uh, the measurement of time is one quadrillionth of a second. So 10 to the power minus 15, that's one quadrillionth of a second. So that 
actually sums up the whole thing that it is a very, very, very brief pulse that is uh, hit onto a particular target tissue and does not cause any collateral damage. So that is what a femtosecond is. And as you can see that it, uh, it falls in the uh, infrared, uh, this thing, that is 1064 nanometer, that is where the femtosecond falls. Now, when uh, this is common also for LASIK uh, because femtosecond uh, first came in to be used for a flap creation in LASIK procedures. And what a femtosecond does is that it's a high intensity uh, laser energy, which is only one micron, which hits and creates what is known as a microplasma. And this uh, microplasma tends to expand. So this is how it expands. It causes a microscopic bubble and this causes photo disruption of the tissue. And if you stack these layers uh, horizontally or what, sorry. Screen to नहीं आ रहा ये दूसरा है क्या क्या लगा रहा है लगा लगा इधर नहीं आ रहा क्या okay uh, did you see the last slide or you didn't no this one you saw so actually you have a one micron bubble that is uh, created it expands right so if you stack up these one like after this, that is in a horizontal fashion, or you can stack them up vertically. So you will actually get the creation of cleavage planes. So that is what it is. And then you have to go back and separate it. So femto is therefore, after it was being used for refractive surgery, the tool is now being used for cataract surgery. And we often uh, tend to call it as uh, the Flax, that is femto laser assisted cataract surgery. It does not, it is complementary and supplementary to phaco emulsification. It is not that it takes away the entire procedure of phaco emulsification. And this is akin, this is trying to up the level of cataract surgery to a refractive procedure as it is. So there are only four steps that the femto does today. The first step that every femto does is known as a capsulorexis. The second is that it fragments the lens into small pieces so that the quantum of energy that you need, need to crack or break or emulsify a nucleus goes down significantly. The third thing is that it creates the incision and the fourth is that it does the LRI which Ram had uh, uh, just very eloquently talked about for taking care of uh, the astigmatism. So a femto assisted rex is always is precise and accurate. So you can fix the size, you want a five millimeter excess, 5.2, and you can also place it anywhere on the capsule. So you can do it a centration on the capsular bag, you can center it on the pupil, you can center it on the limbus, or you can customize it and move it and do uh, whatever you want as it is. So this is, you get a perfect centered uh, capsular excess as compared to a manual one. So this is uh, how the machine that uh, I love to use, which is a liquid optic interface. So there are two parts of the machine. So one is there is a suction ring that comes onto the cornea, onto the limbus. And this is a liquid optic interface. So this does not have a direct strong applination or a contact between the patient interface and the cornea and does not therefore cause folds. Earlier there were some uh, capsular uncut areas that were coming because of the dense pressure or the intense pressure of the patient interface on the cornea causing posterior folds which led to uncut areas, okay? So this is a liquid optic interface where you put fluid into this after applying suction and this is on the under surface of the machine and this comes and docks into the eye. Now this is uh, the how the femto is done. So you can see this is after the docking. Every femto has a OCT inbuilt. So this is a real time OCT that is happening. You can see the, this was the pupil. This is the LRI that you are having. This is the capsulotomy and this is the quadrants that we are having. This is the LRI. And you can see that this is the capsulotomy that is done. This is uh, uh, done in about a second. Uh, and then this is the nucleotomy that is happening. And then you will see the LRI. Uh, because of the arcus, we have not included the incision in this particular case. So you can see that this is the LRI that is happening. And this is the complete procedure that has been done. And now once you go ahead, you have a pre-chopped nucleus, as you can see. 
and you will be able to take it out much earlier. Now let's just see as to the application of femtolaser in routine cataracts and actually it brings you that additional safety factor in lot of difficult cases. So this is a posterior polar cataract that all of you know and there is a pre-existing weakness that is there in the posterior capsule that all of you are aware. So how does a femto help in this particular case? Whenever these uh, bubbles are formed, it causes a pneumodissection. So you don't need fluid to cause a hydrodissection or a hydrodilation and you know that if you cause hydrodissection, you can rupture the posterior capsule. So therefore, the pneumodissection that happens helps you, you get a good capsulotomy and you get nuclear disassembly that is there. So the ASOCT, as you can see here, can you see that this is a defect which is there in the posterior capsule. The ASOCT actually lets you be prepared that is there a pre-existing defect or not. So I'll just show you what we do is that in this particular case, these are the bubbles which is where the nucleotomy is going to be done. You are just elevating it. Can you see those bubbles coming up? And therefore the nucleotomy is happening only in this area that we are going to have. So you are developing what is known as a epinuclear cushion. So that will stay right in the end and this was reported in Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery and you can see that how it helps. This is a pre-existing defect which you can see on slit lamp. Polar cataract that's going to have a nucleus drop if you are going to work. So when you are working on the uh, femto you see that uh, this we are working. You see this defect. Can you see this? Absolutely clearly that there is a defect here. So what we will do is that we will take the nucleotomy up and once we take the nucleotomy up, that's a capsulotomy which you are seeing. Uh, the capsulotomy is completed and you have a pre-cut, pre-chopped nucleus, okay? And this is a microscopic integrated OCT which is on the other side that you are seeing. And this is the intra-op OCT which is showing you the pre-existing defect. So what we have done is we have done no hydrodissection, no delineation, the nuclear fragmentation is there. There is a thick epinuclear cushion and we have been able to take out the nucleus. Okay, and now when we go ahead, it is only at the end you are doing the uh, irrigation aspiration of the cortex and you can see that defect, it's shining through, but you do not allow the chamber to be decompressed, okay, and this is, you can see on the OCT, this is the vitreous coming out, there is no vitreous and you can then go ahead and put in an intraocular lens. So you have, this is the photo essay that has been published, the slit lamp shows you this defect, you can see the IOL Master 700 also showing you this defect. This is of the intra-op OCT, uh, uh, so the uh, catalyst system. This is the intra-op OCT showing the epinuclear cushion. This is when the epinuclear cushion has been removed and this is the defect that you have, okay? So the imaging helps you work on a posterior polar cataract by having this epinuclear shield which allows you to actually get, get ahead. So this is the airbag or the air cushion that you need when you are driving a car so that if there is a crash, you don't get into a problem which is there. Now femtosecond assisted cataract surgeries can also be done in difficult cases. For example, if you are small, well, uh, this was a question that I was asking. This is a malugin ring that has been put and once you put a malugin ring, you can go ahead with a dilated pupil and do this. So I'll just show you a real life situation. Uh, this is uh, uh, the patient and you can see the malugin ring is being inserted. Once the malugin ring has been inserted, you go ahead with the femto. You can see it's a subluxated cataract which is, which is there and the subluxated cataracts have a great uh, 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 application for the femto for uh, going ahead and do th these cases. If you have cases of phacomorphic glaucoma, these are intumescent cataracts. You can see that in these particular cases, there is a swollen, can you see this huge swollen lens? You can see the iris is touching the back of the cornea. And if you go in, what is that called? If you go, just nix the capsule, what is that called? You will get in an intumescent Argentinian flag sign. But you can see here that in this, this was a, uh, this is a closed chamber technique. You haven't opened the, uh, this thing, so the intralenticular pressure is not high, so you can see that you get a good capsular excess, as you can see in this particular case, even in a case of phacomorphic glaucoma, and then you can complete the surgery. So phacomorphic glaucoma, again, you have, this is a rock hard cataract. You can see grade four, grade five, actually grade five cataract. And the femto has the power to penetrate even rock hard cataracts, white cataracts, it cannot cut because it does not focus. But in rock hard cataracts, you saw that bubbles that came out, I'll just show you again. Just see this, can you see these bubbles that are coming out? See these? So what it shows is that you have been able to cleave this black cataract. You can see it's actually a black cataract. And this obviously harder the cataract, more is the 
reduction in the energy that you require for phaco emulsification to get it. So, you work with this in a perfect rexis and you can actually do uh, a good outcome in this. Now, this is a post traumatic subluxation. Now, when you are doing a subluxated cataract, doing capsular rexis is a great problem, okay. Uh, because you do not have a counter traction. And second is if there is vitreous coming out as you can see here, I will show you on the OCT, then again you keep on hydrating the vitreous and how do you tackle this and how does the power of femto work here. So, what we have described is a limited power splinter vitrectomy for optimizing surgical outcomes. It is always better to take the help of a posterior segment surgeon to debulk the vitreous and keep that on during the procedure and that is what you see. So, can you see here this is a subluxation. Can you see here a subluxation and this is the vitreous which is here if you can make out. So, this is the vitreous which is there uh, which you are wanting to work on. So, now we are aligning both the anterior and the posterior capsule. This is what I am saying. This is a custom center. You saw I can move the capsulotomy and I can customize and center it. There is a good capsulotomy that has happened, a good nucleotomy that has happened. We have gone in through the pars plana and we have removed the vitreous that is coming. Go with the cutter, put tri on and remove whatever excess vitreous is there so that you do not get a hydration and you do not keep getting a problem. So, we have gone in, the nucleotomy is done, we have done a CTR. You all know what CTR, that is a capsular tension ring. And then you can see that we go in and we are able to remove the nucleus as, uh, as easily and then this is the cortex that is being removed. Once the CTR is there also, it is always preferable. This is you maintain the chamber, you put viscoelastic, always better to put a three piece intraocular lens because it pushes the capsule and acts like a CTR again. Uh, this is the post traumatic case that we have. So, as technology of femto cataract has evolved, it finds widespread use in complex cases and I think uh, uh, the number of patients who are going to go in for femto cataract has increased over time. At least in my personal practice, 80 percent of my patients undergo a femto. Uh, now, what you have to see is that there is another technology that came, I came with a little bit of a ripple. I think nobody is using it. There were a couple of uh, units that were sold uh, in India, but this is a precision pulse technology. It is an innovative soft device. So, this is uh, accurate reproducible capsulotomy that happens and it is an instantaneous capsulotomy. You put a ring and uh, this small ring which is 5 or 5.5, it goes on the capsule. There is a suction that is applied on the capsule a millisecond of, a, of a electric current is passed and that causes the burn in the hole. So, this is the disposable handpiece you have. You can see this is for the marker and this is the suction cap that you have which is going to pull up the uh, femto. So, you can uh, the, the capsule you can see soft clear suction tip and this is made of nitalol capsulotomy ring. So, what it does is it has an excellent memory, but it is foldable. So, as it goes, it goes in, it folds, but then when it comes back, it opens and this is how you put it on the capsule and uh, there is obviously thing that you will generate heat, but uh, what they have shown is that all the places, the heat generation, because it is such a small time, uh, it does not generate heat to an extent. So, you can see here, this is staining of the capsule, which is always preferable. This is the ring that is there, suction that is being applied. You just hold on and you saw that was a microsecond of a pulse which was there and you get a good capsulotomy. So, this does only a capsulotomy which is there and you can finish it off. Uh, it is an expensive thing, only capsulotomy it does because every uh, procedure you have to see, you cannot reuse it and potential of thermal damage is there. There is another thing that has been, uh, that has come out by Zeiss which is again made of the same thing which is the nitrolol, the same material that has been used in the Zepto and this is cutting like a snare. You can see this, it is a thin thing, you just take it around, I will just show you. Uh, you can see it is, it cuts pretty well, this is a, a, a cashew nut you can see and how it is slicing a cashew nut. This is, um, uh, we are just doing it outside, this is an almond. So, all of you who are, this is a croat, so all of you who are, uh, uh, <laughs> want to have, and this is supari. So, you can see uh, I did not give a supari to anybody, but uh, this is uh, uh, again very hard, but you can see that here also we were able to get a slice through. Uh, so, you can do it in a rock hard cataract. So, this is uh, the ring uh, that is going in, you can see and uh, it looks very dangerous that you are going to rupture the capsule, but it is so flexible and pliable that it does not cause any significant problem. You go back, uh, go behind the nucleus, you can see this and then what you do is that you just pull it. And uh, this is how you do and it, you can see that it will come, you have to just push back the nucleus and you can see that it is uh, cutting it. So, this is uh, the nucleus that is being separated, you can go back, these are two pieces that have happened, 
uh, you can go back again and make another piece that is there and uh, you can make four, six, eight pieces. You can see we are going again in the hemi section and this is uh, the cutting the, that you have uh, for uh, the, so you can see we can make these pieces. So this is called as a my loop. Uh, which is also which is available. So to sum up and conclude, these were a couple of the ways that we are looking to handle cataract and many devices aids have been developed. There is also a capsular capsulotomy thing which is coming under the microscope uh, that you can put and you can do a capsulotomy. So precision, accuracy, gentleness is what is the aim of cataract surgery today. And uh, we want to reduce the surgical time and the ultrasonic power of FACO emulsification to reduce collateral damage that is there. Each machine comes with its pros and cons and obviously with the cost, but I think uh, some are getting more acceptance and technology changes at a rapid pace. Only the ones that withstand the test of time will survive. The other important thing is that intraocular lenses are also making giant and rapid uh, leaps uh, along with the technology of cataract surgery. So I think by the time uh, you guys are, uh, are with 10 years, 15 years of experience, I think presbyopia will be treated by removing the lenses and putting in some form of a, a trifocal lens and things like that. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was a great overview about the latest technologies that we are today going to be using. And all of you, definitely, when you start practice, and now for your exams, you should definitely know what are the principles that are going to be followed in all these technologies. So uh, I think we are now uh, coming to the last. Yes. yes. The only thing is, uh, uh, we have done it even, uh, they, they say that the difference between the capsule and the back of the cornea should be more than about 1.8 uh, millimeters. So that's about it, it should not be too near. But there are no specific parameters that you want to do. There are some people who reduce the depth. So when you're doing a capsulotomy, you... F so there are two things, one is you play on the depth. So these are two counterintuitive thoughts. One thought is that you want the capsulotomy to become faster. Uh, the second is that you want that if there is a change in the sudden change in the depth of the whole thing, you uh, you want that it should cut deeper. So when you're doing a capsulotomy, there is a top and there is a bottom. So uh, this is maybe 400 microns, 500 microns. Some people say reduce it. Some people say increase it because there is going to be a fluctuation in the chamber the moment some internal lenticular fluid. So one is depending upon that what you want to do, I normally do increase the depth by about 200 microns. That is mine and then you can increase the energy levels because you are wanting that even if there is some fluid, you want it to cut uh, this thing. Uh, that is what you want, okay? There are some people who have even tried, uh, Mohan may talk about panchorexes, that's something different, but you can actually also have a smaller rex is done on a femto. Uh, maybe a 4.5 or 4.2 rather than a 5.2 because uh, as you go down slope, there is a possibility of extension, but normally you don't have extension. You need to put trepan blue because there can be skip areas. And even on the skip areas, you get post stamp perforation. So you can actually get, so treatment of choice for two of the things that I told you, actually three of them, posterior polar cataract, uh, as Mohan said, I would push the patient or even if we have to pay, I'll want that patient to go in for a femto, intumescent cataracts, uh, phacomorphic glaucoma, treatment of choice that is there, and uh, subluxated lenses because you can get good capsulotomies in that. So this is uh, the power of femto, I think, which uh, actually enhances the outcomes for them. Okay. Um, Any other questions? Sir, also yeah. in patients who have corneal gattata and fuchs patients, so you are reducing the phaco energy when you are doing uh, femto laser. So actually there are several studies which have shown that uh, there is a reduction of energy. The harder the cataract, more is the reduction and the reduction could be between 50 to 66% of the energy levels that you have. Uh, and uh, nowadays uh, what happens is that when you are passing the cut, the cut actually starts from bottom to top. Uh, there is something that, uh, 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 what's her name? Uh, Singapore. Chisu. Chisu. Frank, she has described is that you can leave the central one millimeter. You don't need to actually go to the central one millimeter. And the three passes that you have at the same place, you can actually do it with a single pass. So that reduces the quantum of femto energy also that is being used. But that is enough to cut. And uh, the energy settings you are uh, saying is that when you are coming from bottom to up, the amount of energy that you are using in the nucleus at the bottom is more than what you are using at the top. 
Okay, so there is a change in the energy which is automatic, which is preset in the machines from uh, a higher level at the inferior part of the posterior part of the nucleus versus the anterior part. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Just one uh, point is where you cannot use a femto is if there is a corneal opacity, then the laser will not penetrate. And if it's a very small pupil, then definitely you cannot because the capsulotomy is not possible in a very small pupil. So you basically need an optically clear medium for the femto to penetrate. That's important. So a uh, lot of uh, corneal opacities, you will say no. And uh, small pupil, I told you, you will have to go ahead and dilate and do it. Thank you. So I'd like to now invite our last speaker for the day, Dr. Arvind Kumar Maurya. He's the additional professor and head of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, B.B. Nagar, with a keen interest in artificial intelligence and a recipient of several awards in national and international conferences. So he'll yeah. be speaking to us on SICS step by step. Slide, slide. Thank you, Anagha ma'am, for such a nice introduction. And thank you, Maipal sir, Bonavar sir, Rashmin sir, and uh, Rolika, and my team is here. So uh, how many of you have done more than 100 surgeries in, during your post-graduation? Raise your hand. Very few. OK. So we will start with the different steps which we do in SICS, although time is only 15 minutes. So uh, I will start with a question. Do we have the mic for the audience also? So PECO came first or the M6? Which year? Which year? Okay, very much near, 1967 by Kalman. So the answer is uh, Peko only. Yeah, and it was, this technique was, uh, means propagated and uh, by Blumenthal in 92 and 99 by Roet at the Tilganga Eye Center in Kathmandu, Nepal. And the incision size for the audience, not for me, it varies from 3.5 to 7.5 millimeter, depending on the density of the nucleus and the size of the nucleus, okay? Then what are the indications? So supra hard, mature and hyper mature cataracts when you don't have the uh, liberty or the privilege of plaques, okay? And the pseudo exfoliation with weak jonules and the beginners, very good for the beginners. It's a very good surgery. And also we can learn a lot of steps which have, we are gonna do in the PECO emulsification. We can learn while doing the SICS, okay? And uh, in the third world ophthalmic setup, when we don't have the expensive PECO uh, setup and also in the lens induced glaucoma. And when there is a PCR during PECO, so we can convert into M6 at any point of time. And so uh, there, when we are, uh, what are the signs of general weakness? So when we initiate the initial mix, so there will be radial wrinkles in the capsule. You can see in this picture, can you appreciate that? So now we, you, you need to have some senior person along with you because there is chances of journaler dialysis and weakness can be there. So these are the different indications. Second is pseudo exfoliation. Upper one is the supra hard, cataracta nigra. And then when there is journaler dialysis. So uh, as an examiner, we ask the, at, at a particular step, which instrument you will use. So there are instruments also and the steps also. So first is the superior rectus bridal suture. So first is the superior rectus holding forceps. So what is the distance between the first atraumatic curve and the second curve and why? Why? Very good. Because that is the distance of the superior recti. And then 5-0 cell suture, and which is speculum are the best and why? Hmm? Self-retaining, yes. 
yeah and putting le least pressure over the eyeball during the surgery because if there is pressure then there will be iris prolapse and lot of other things okay so the murdochs and the castro visio these self retaining eye speculum are very handy very useful and then the full form of the assk superior rectus holding forceps and it has a lock and release system you can see so it holds the needle and release it then we do the conjunctival peritomy in the 4 o'clock hour from 10 to 12 o'clock and minimum cautery avoiding limbus why very good to prevent any damage to the limbal stem cell very good and this is the lymph forceps by which we hold the conjunctiva and that this is a bipolar cautery and Westcott scissor we use for the peritomy. Then incision, the main incision it has three parts. First is the external scleral, then the sclerocorneal channel and then the internal incision. So these are the part of the main incision. So we use the Bart Parker handle with 15 degree blade and one third or the half of the scleral thickness approximately 0 0.8 millimeter and uh, the crescent blade so it has a central or peripheral entry up to the 1.5 millimeter so for the beginner they need to have a peripheral entry so if it is too deep or too superficial we can make another tunnel another incision so how much to enter into the cornea very good and how far from the limbus yeah, more than 2, between 2 to 2.5 millimeter. Then what are the types of incision? So these are the smiling, this is the easiest to make, but it leads to highest astigmatism. Then straight, easiest to learn, then the frown and the chevron, they put least astigmatism and then there is uh, inverted bat wing type of incision also. Okay, so for the beginners, straight incision is good so how to enter means so there will be forward motion of the crescent uh, 2, 2 to 2.5 millimeter then into the cornea for 1.5 millimeter and then along the curve of the eyeball slight curve we need to take and forward motion and then bringing it back sweeping back to avoid any premature entry we are going forward and then when we are extending the incision, we are doing the swiping motion in the backward direction. Then the side port at 3 o'clock position before entry through the main incision. So what are the advantages of side port? Yes, very good. We can remove the sub-incision cortex. Yes. Yes, capsulorectus. Yes. Yeah, AC will be formed most of the time. Ha, ah, yes, we can uh, dialing of the aisle also. Yes. Yes. So when we are doing the irrigation aspiration through the main incision, so there are more chances of because AC becomes shallower. But while doing from the side port, yeah. Then for the capsular axis, so we need a larger axis in SICS, 5.5 to 6 millimeter. So a trepan blue dye, 0.06 percent, and it is an acid diazo group dye that we often ask uh, during the PG examination. And using the hydro cannula, and the beginners can start with the can opener and later on do the continuous curvilinear capsular axis. So there are different techniques of doing that by using the cystitome. So how many bands are there in the cystitome and how it is made? Okay, two and how it is made? Very good. And we can also use the Uttaratas forcep and microcapsular axis forcep if we need a better control of the rexis. We need to hold the rexis after one o'clock hour again and again using the microcapsular axis forceps in which conditions yeah intumescent very good mm -hmm. yes yes yeah. 
zone of weakness, yes, very good. Pediatric, better control. And then uh, in the intermission cataract, uh, someone asked the question, so we can use the, this Dr. Rajendra Prasad sphingital microcapsulotome. So it made a very small opening that is very regular. So we can also use this. And there is a beautiful article in JCRS. You can go through the whole article. We don't have time for that. So what are the advantages of continuous curvilinear capsular access? What? Yeah, very good. What else? What else? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, very good. We can uh, put the RL, yes, over the ciliary sulcus. What else? Regarding the premium IOL, sir was talking about. Uh, so for the good centration, some margin need to cover the optic all the time. So for the centration and for the good results of such premium IOL, we need a very good rex. Okay. Then main incision entry is a, using the 2.8 or a 3.2 keratome and there needs to be a dimpling at the time of entry. That shows that it's a good entry. So it will be a triplanar type of incision. You can see in the diagram, okay? And then we can extend it using the 5.2 keratome and very good side pockets are needed. Why in SICS? Yeah, very good. Then hydro dissection and deviation, uh, it needs to be gentle at multiple places with gentle central tapping using the hydro cannula. So these are few of the videos. So this is how the nucleus is prolapsed into the anterior chamber. If the ECD is good, you can be vertical while dealing with the nucleus. But if the ECD is less, you need to be parallel to the iris plane while maneuvering the large nucleus. So this is how it is prolapsed using the Sinsky hook, viscoelastic above and down towards the endothelia also. And then removal using the wire vector. So these are the different methods of dealing the nucleus. This is the Ruet's technique. So first a small uh, rexis is made, then the enlargement of the rexis, it is prolapsed into the anterior chamber. Now you can see it's parallel to the iris plane and using the Simco cannula, the surgeon is removing the nucleus. So there is no need of the continuous anterior chamber maintainer. And then the visco expression technique, video is not running. IT people, yeah, it's running. Yeah. So it's a very hard nucleus you can see and the ECD is very less. Cornea is also hazy. So I'm very much parallel to the iris plane only and visco at the tip of the, this tunnel and this is how it is removed by some positive pressure in the anterior chamber using the viscoelastic through the side port. And then this is our, our technique of hydro expression. So a side port is made and it is a intermission type of cataract as you can see. So side port is made and then dye and removal of dye. Now you can see the cornea is so much haze is there, you can appreciate that under the blue dye and then the regular rexis. I started with the cystitone, but there was so much of pressure was there. So I take the help of the microcapsular axis forcer. Three, four minutes. <laughs> and this is how it is prolapsed into the anterior chamber. And then a specially designed hydro cannula with three side ports. So there is no need of anterior chamber maintainer. It goes behind the nucleus and this is how it comes out. 
So it's published in uh, IG also, you can go through it. Then the IOL implantation, the PMMA IOL. So we use the Mac person four chip. So how to hold it, uh, the IOL with the Mac person four chip? Hmm? Yeah, just like a pen. So uh, the refractive index is uh, 1.49 with a specific gravity of 1.2. These again we asked during your PG examination with two holes. So we use uh, Sinsky hooks for that and then removal of the cortex on OVD using the two-way Sinco cannula. And so what are the signs of PCL centration in the back and the optic needs to be covered by the anterior capsular axis margin all around 360 degree and line of centration. The stressed out capsule you can see. And uh, the air bubble. So what is the importance of air bubble after doing the surgery? And it acts as a tamponade. So the triplanar incision, it, uh, it heals rapidly. So what are the steps of making main incision? It's over, sir, only few MCQ. Only few MCQ, it's over. MCQ? Yeah. Oh, OK. Hmm? So there will be external incision, then the sclerocorneal tunnel, then the main incision. OK. So that incision giving least astigmatism. Yes, very good. And between brown and chevron? Yes. Okay. So is M6 possible with two millimeter of incision? And who started this? Yes, anyone? It's an Indian surgeon. It starts from A. Yes, it can be done using the two millimeter. In India, it was first done at Ames Jodhpur and it was done by uh, Dr. Amulya Sahu. <laughs> okay. Now, can we put premium IELTS in M6? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arvin, for an excellent presentation. I think they have all enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have now come to the end of the first uh, uh, session. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolika. Uh, we continue? Yes, sir. Huh? Right. So we no, uh, move on.